What's up, guys? It is Modern Craftsman Monday. Monday. And we have Ben from Homemade Modern uh, on the podcast this week. Uh, big topic is talking about sustainability, but also making architecture, design, um, and just overall, well, I was going to say, I guess, overall design more obtainable and, and less expensive. I, yeah, I, I, I didn't realize he was so such an entrepreneur i think that it's it's a refreshing take on what we do what builders do and the industry from more of one like an academic perspective but also an entrepreneur entrepreneurial perspective and like the ethics behind it yeah i think is 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 really interesting and you know we all strive to build the biggest coolest most expensive house where he's he's working almost in the opposite direction for a really great reason. Yeah, it was a good one. So we, we, we were <laughs> we were starting to talk about these container houses, and I'd like to actually jump right into that because that is something yeah. that you're working on. Um, you've been working on for, what, over a year now? The one, the one that you advertise, right? Yeah, so uh, I bought some land in Joshua Tree about two years ago. Uh, spent three to four months permitting a shipping container house, just a single family residence on 10 acres. Uh, Home Depot was the lead sponsor for this project and uh, took, yeah, it took about three to four months for permits and then spent about 12 to 16 weeks building it all out. Uh, it's been done for actually quite a while now, but we've been kind of slowly releasing a 10 part video series about the whole project from permits to occupancy. And you know, I think right now we're sitting at about 18 to 19 million views for the series and uh, got, to, got, to, got to show in detail a lot of the, the myths that have sort of been there about shipping container houses, about how they're going to be this affordable solution, this way to, to house the homeless and all these things. And it, it, it's so interesting now that so many people call me like the, the shipping container house guy as if I'm a big fan of it. And really the reason I did the series was much more of a myth busting kind of thing to be like, look, yes, you can, you can build a house out of anything. doesn't mean it's a good idea. And when I was an architecture professor, I'd always see these, you know, these students that were mesmerized by this kind of dystopian future aesthetic, this very blade runner meets junkyard kind of burning man look and being like, Oh yeah, you can just plug in and play the shipping containers like Legos. I'm like, all right. If there's, if there's one thing I've learned in my experience involving construction is that nothing is completely plug and play and nothing goes together like Legos. It's, it, may, it may seem like that. It may be marketed that way. It's always at least one step more complicated than that. So in seeing all this very misleading, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, really just low quality journalism in the design and architecture space about this subject matter, I thought, well, there seems to be interest, and I haven't seen anything that kind of actually shows how you would get it done from a legally permitted way. So uh, what better topic than something that has high search volume and not a lot of great information on? And so that's that was kind of the reason why we did it. Um, so there's yeah, we a couple also sort of things from a, leading, yeah. to, leading to want. I, I think what you're saying is there's a couple things leading to why you did this series and uh, build is – because number one, you wanted to kind of prove a point that it's it's not as inexpensive as people tend to think it is. But also, you you just mentioned a high search volume because people are looking for it because they there's there's interest around it and there's nothing out there. You're basically from a content perspective, you're filling a void because no one's showing you how, this is how you legally build a shipping container house. Right. So in in my business, the majority of the income comes from the content side. Uh, both working directly with sponsors, doing product placement into the designs themselves, and then uh, also uh, from you know the the automated ad placement with you know like the AdSense products that that YouTube uses to place ads into content you post on their platform. So finding something that a lot of people are interested in and not a lot of people have done is kind of the most ideal scenario. And most of the shipping container houses that we had seen were done in Australia. Um, or places like that. And they had a few blog posts, uh, but nothing sort of comprehensive uh, and certainly nothing 
that ever delved into the permitting process. I think there's this assumption that, oh, if you start with this steel box, your structure is already there. But the minute you cut it, that structure is compromised. And then it's, it's also a question of how is your building department going to evaluate the, the structural uh, integrity that's left in the cut container. And what, what we found that was kind of fascinating is that even if they did consider the structural merit of the steel in the container, there was concerns that because it's the exterior, that if it you know rusts or corrodes over time, even though they're made out of core 10 steel, and that's very unlikely, that there could be, uh, you know, you wouldn't want your structure exposed to the elements and then that sort of, you know, degrades in weather or corrosive environments and then your whole building collapse because yeah. the, the structure rusts. Usually your, your structural elements are protected. Exactly. So this, this exoskeleton idea, uh, you know, often compromises any actual kind of physical strength that the, the exterior steel has. So do you say you bought 10 acres in Joshua Tree? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, you that's know, we Tyler's takeaway. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, What's the? How much does that cost? It was twenty thousand um, oh, dollars, and from an investment standpoint, uh, me and oh, one of my business partners had been you know trying to think about where we want to do our next sort of experimental builds for a while, and you know, urban. We'd done a three-unit development in Jamaica Plain in Boston. Uh, but one of the things we were thinking of like, well, if we're looking for places with good return, yes, if you sort of find the right sort of neighborhood that's upwardly mobile, that's ideal, but everyone else is looking for that too. And fundamentally, I just sort of thought, well, at this point, nature's only going to get more valuable. And we started looking at uh, visitorship to national parks. And if you, you know, this data is all publicly available. And if you look at the visitorship to all the national parks, it's all on a pretty dramatic upward trajectory. And it correlates pretty, pretty well to the rise in Instagram as the sort of most popular social media uh, platform for, for posting selfies and vacation pics. So what we sort of concluded from that was uh, there's inexpensive land outside a lot of these national parks, and there's not a lot of major hospitality centers there. So what better place to do these kind of experimental builds in one locations that are really beautiful and picturesque, which is great for the content, but more importantly, places that more and more people are going to, to kind of escape cities for the weekend or, you know, people that can work digitally uh, remotely uh, going out there for like a month or two to, to write a book or, you know, build an app or whatever it is. So I was looking at Joshua Tree, which has always been one of my favorite places to go climbing since I'm, I'm from Southern California originally. And so, wow, they got 3 million visitors to the park, uh, or they sold 3 million passes to the park last year. And, you know, that's probably about one and a half people per, per pass. Uh, land's really inexpensive there. Let's, let's build out there. It's got a cool looking landscape. What a great spot to kind of do this kind of experimental building. So what, what was the permitting process like? Because you, okay. Yeah. So it was, it was challenging, right? They, they have a pretty good San Bernardino County was the permitting uh, county that we were in. Joshua Tree is about two hours from there. Uh, you know, we had some phone calls first and used their, their sort of online portal, which is, which is actually pretty good. Um, in general, like I found that permitting in rural areas is you don't get as clear answers and there isn't the same level of sort of fast professionalism, but everyone has more time to be helpful too because they're not as overburdened as they are mm -hmm. or as they can be in some cities. So, uh, you know, we originally called and did that and they're like, ship a container house, okay. And they weren't really sure. And so what we found was with the experimental stuff, they kept punting on us. They kept sort of just asking another question, asking another sure. question. So what I finally did was took the drawings in the state that they were in, set up a meeting, went in there and be like, look, I just want like, you know, two hours, bring all the people in, let's just go line by line. And that worked really well. So, you know, when, when I highly encourage anyone, if you're doing something that's a little bit unusual, sit down with them. And it, the minute they see that you're actually sincere uh, about trying to find the solution and that you're also just not going to give up on it, I think more importantly, uh, 
they they tend to sort of work with you to find a solution rather than just ask a question to try to get rid of you <laughs> till the next round. Let me stop you there for a second because I think even you know not it doesn't just have to be something out of the ordinary even working in Boston. You said you did a project in Boston mm-hmm. here. Even like working with you know with Boston or or your local uh, jurisdiction for even just a normal house that may, you know, for instance, we deal with FAR, like homes that are Mm. too big for a lot or need a variance. I I would say it's the same thing. It's, you know, talking, having if when you can a face to face meeting and explain like, this is my intention. I'm here to help work through this together. I'm not looking to, you know, just ask for forgiveness be, you know, or, or ask right. for permission without doing my due diligence and, and showing face. I think that's really important to note a lot. I, I see a lot of guys just like they're, uh, you, you've been in Boston building department. So, you know, the, yeah. the guys that are in line just, you know, barking and yelling and telling them that they need this and they need that. And it's like, you know, if anything, they're hurting our chances because they're just pissing the, the inspector off. Right. And and I think there's this mentality within a lot of sort of developers that you kind of have to push your way through. Mm. Uh, in in my experience, like I've, I, I know a lot of developers that do that and do that pretty well. But if you're getting started, uh, you know, you might want to try the other tact first. Uh, mm. You know, I certainly wouldn't want to work in any of the planning or development offices and, you, you know, dealing with people that are, as upset as people in the DMV, but with higher financial stakes involved, <laughs> uh, the the level of frustration and, and challenge for their job relative to the upside of what they're sort of compensated for is it's not a desirable one for me. So I try right. to try to really personalize it, be as friendly as possible, and not you know, I I felt frustration in every single project that I've ever gone through permitting with, uh, but. I, I won't go to any of those meetings if that's the kind of uh, uh, feeling that I have uh, walking into that. I think it's I think it's uh, underrated how important it is to be incredibly civil, polite, and actually own their things, not just the same way I don't want them to just punt on me and just push questions off. Uh, I don't want to just try to get by with the bare minimum. I really want to ask them, like, what would make this easier for you? You know, wh- what are any doubts that you might have? And and then uh, also ask them like, you know, or tell them that, you know, oh, and if you need to use this as a reference set for anyone else to feel free to share the the structural, you know, calculations, I got permission from my engineer first to do that, but happy to sort of share and connect if, if anyone else is struggling with this and uh, need some help with uh, seeing how we did it. So it's funny because I feel like working outside of your typical area has its own challenges and headaches, especially with the building department. Like if you if nobody knows who you are, they see that you're. We applied for a small job. I don't know an hour away from us, which is further than we typically travel, and it was such a headache to get permits because it's like they don't trust you. They don't know you. Who are you? Are you going to try and pull the wool over our eyes? Which is just, I think meeting them in person probably would have helped had I just taken the ride. But I tried to do it. Uh, over the phone and email and it was not the easiest process yeah yeah they, and they they want you to see that you're putting effort in yeah because all the other guys that are trying to do that pull the wool over their eyes aren't right so i mean we've i always take the same approach nick is just go in try and make it easy to them i've even said hey any paperwork you need i'll take it from concom over to right. you know, board of health would I, I can be that guy meaning i'm invested into this whole process um unlike it, sometimes it doesn't work. My project it's, in Carlisle is an absolute disaster. And it and it stinks like right now everything's online and a lot of it's been online for, you know, before COVID and it's it taking that personal side out of it. And I, I remember it was probably three years ago we were looking for a final inspection on a project. Meanwhile, it was a 700 square foot condo. We had too many speakers in the ceiling. So they had all the uh, the low voltage brought up to nightclub standard. So we had all these shunt relays. Basically, if the fire alarm went off, the music cut, all, the TV shut, like all this stuff had to shut off. And trying to get an inspection, it took me six and a half months for final inspection because it was just, I'd call, no, you have to come in. I'd come in, I'd, I was, and I was frustrated, like you said, Ben, but it's like, I go right. in, you know, I'm not going to use their name. And, you know, hey, how you doing? How's it going today? Oh, yeah, I know I blew you off last week. Let's schedule something for next week. 
I'd sit there next week. They wouldn't show up. It was the same story. And it was like, I really want to get mad, and but I'm just going to keep my cool. You get the final inspection. The next job, same inspector, right away. Right. And it's like, it was almost like this test of like, when's he going to, when's he going to get pissed off at me so I can then like use it against him for the rest of right. eternity. Yeah. Um, but what is, speak like going back to the shipping container, you know, so permitting, you know, I think of like high rise construction and when we were doing that, the inspector comes out, but he's not inspecting anything because everything's an affidavit. There's right. engineers that are just basically signing off. Even nowadays, it's like that's that's everything now. Yeah, it's like, hey, did you know you have a structure stamp structural? Okay, yeah, you're good. Or did you gotta get a third party to come out and look at the insulation? Like all of these things. So what was what was the hang up? You know, what was there a hang up after that two hour meeting? Uh, not too much. There's there's a few things about uh, the foundation was kind of like the the tricky part, you know. The containers are, are pretty rigid and uh, we insulated inside the sort of steel and then added continuous insulation over the plywood deck floor of the container. So from a foundation standpoint, we it seemed from the beginning like, oh, we could just, you know, do some footings under the corners or at the very worst case scenario, do some court, sort of, uh, you know, ridge beam or just sort of continuous footing. But then if we didn't do if we did anything except a complete concrete slab which is totally redundant structurally we would have needed 18 inches off the ground because they would have classified it as a crawl space and that would have kind of you know we really want to have this flow from inside to outside without railings or sort of raised decks so it ended up being this compromise of overbuilding the, the foundation to kind of have the kind of egress between inside and outside that we wanted um, so that was a little tricky sort of figuring that out. Um, the other sort of back and forth was on the way we were securing the containers to the slab. We're in a sort of a mild seismic zone, but there was concern that if there was an earthquake, the container would slide separate from the slab and shear off the plumbing and electrical uh, connections that go into the slab. So originally our structural engineer uh, spec the system that would have involved very precisely locating uh, for uh, embeds into the concrete, these basically these uh, bridge clamps, which are used to hold down or hold the containers uh, corner to corner. It's like a, a one and a half inch specially threaded rod. It's like, it's like the Acme threads. Um, mm -hmm. And one, each one of those bridge clamps was like over a thousand dollars. And uh, I didn't trust our concrete guys to, to, really nail that location there wasn't a lot of flex or 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 forgiveness to it um so we had to sort of modify that and instead used all thread that could be drilled into the concrete afterwards so with any project it's that weird mix between what the structural engineers want what the permitting office wants to see and then what's actually feasible in the right sequence for the guys in the field um and uh yeah it was so what we ended up doing was getting some really heavy three quarter inch L sections. Uh, I got to really upgrade from my typical sort of Ryobi and rigid tool uh, collection and get like the, the giant Milwaukee hammer drill. Like I think like the biggest one they had <laughs> and was pleasantly surprised to see how fast you could drill uh, one and a quarter inch diameter hills uh, holes into, into concrete. And then we sort of epoxy these rods into it. So we ended up having to use four rods per corner uh, epoxied in rather than the, you know, just the one cast in place uh, bridge clamp. But, you know, those kind of little trade-offs are, they can be frustrating in the time, but it actually is what makes, you know, for our standpoint, the video content really useful is, you know, just showing somebody how you did it something but not explaining the why is, isn't that useful in terms of construction content because you inevitably get a whole bunch of comments. Well, why did you do that? That doesn't make right. sense. And really, you know, that there's all those reasons. So that back and forth taking notes, and then when we're presenting what we actually did as the final building solution, we can sort of explain the why behind it. And that I think is one of the reasons why the, the content did so well, because it answered a lot of those questions. It's funny. Uh, yesterday, me and Doug were talking and right really big on the whiteboard. It says today, it says, show the how explain the why right and it's you know that's exactly it we noticed that you know even from like the negative side right which youtube you almost can't avoid 
that all the negativity was why would you do that why would you waste their money why would you like it was always like why 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 and i'm like if we just answer these questions right off the bat then we just we're eliminating all of this bs right and and there's there's such a backlog of whys right for and i think one of my favorite examples of this is a canopy bed uh, so many people associate a canopy bed as oh this is what a princess sleeps in when really it's like a, it's an hvac design idea right so where do princesses sleep in castles what were castles like they're big stone rooms with a fireplace in the corner and really high ceilings you know it's really hard to heat a room like that so they made canopy beds so they could take a little pot of coal and put that into the corner of the bed and heat that up like a tent inside of a giant stone cave so understanding the why explains not just you know what you're doing but it gives you more context to uh things that have become stylistic trends and you know i'm always really impressed when i meet uh, people in the trades that 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 know those whys they're not just following something as a prescription they understand the fundamental concepts behind what they're doing and I think that allows them to imp- uh, improvise a lot more efficiently and safely. Nick, do you have a canopy bid because you're a princess or for the coal? Well, <laughs> it was because I was a princess, but I'm definitely getting a pot of coal. <laughs> I'm Tyler, warmer I saw, in my, I saw in, your I'm, I saw your mic I'm move warmer so in many my times. canopy. Like, I can't wait to say this about Nick. <laughs> I'm warmer in my canopy bed. <laughs> I, I mean that goes with like everything like it's like john like with molding and stuff right it's you know understand like when we talk to brent hall or you know in cucumber brothers it's like why are these things the way they are you know why are they the size they are why why is chair rail a certain height you know why do you use crown mold? like it it is it it's it is wildly important in construction because you're right a lot of people just follow it as a pre- prescription because they think that's what spo- is supposed to be done right and, the, and then that, that makes it more difficult to adapt to sort of a new technology, a new tool or something that actually could be a game changer. But if you don't understand, you know, if you only think of things as sort of additive and don't realize that, oh, wait, because we're doing this here, we don't have to do this here. So we mm-hmm. could spend more on here and that's more expensive than the direct replacement, but it's giving these additional sort of savings down the road. For us, like a big example of that with my architecture firm, Zero Energy Design was sort of not just thinking of the trade-off of insulation directly as at how it would save the utility uh, on utility bills, but also in how it would reduce the size of the HVAC equipment, right? So that was the economic trade-off for, you know, when we were first getting started that a lot of people weren't considering. They were only considering it direct to lowering the cost. But if you're lowering a diff- if you're adding to it one capital expense, but reducing another one, the payback on that additional insulation is a lot shorter. And I don't want to breeze over that because I want to. I do want to talk about zero energy, but to finish the conversation on uh, the container homes, beyond mm-hmm. permitting and the complex um, foundation for it, what were the other things that were kind of uh, advertised as inexpensive, but really dr- drove the cost of that? It's really that. Uh, one, you're starting with siding first and then building inside. So it's nice to, from a security standpoint, that's actually awesome, right? So up until you cut the containers, all the tools and stuff can be locked inside the construction site. So that part, fantastic. Um, cutting the containers, w- relatively easy. We did it all with an angle grinder. A lot of people use a plasma cutter. I did uh, 95% of all the steel work myself. The, the only two parts that I couldn't really do were the structural welding from the the L brackets that were anchored into the concrete to the the corners of the containers that had to be done by a a certified structural welder. And I don't have that certification. Um, So the cutting the steel and all that was, was easy. I mean, the, you can be really precise with an angle grinder and uh, everything was, was, you know, everything's battery powered. Now you just go through a lot of batteries and a lot of uh, cutting discs, but that part was all fine. It's just that it must have stunk. Yeah. Oh, it was just well, it was so loud. Imagine cutting inside a steel box in 105 degrees. Oh it was goodness. it was like doing 8 hours of hot yoga every day. In in a canopy bed? Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. Plus Can plus the imagine? extra heat from the canopy bed. Um <laughs> So that I'm, was I'm literally watching this at the same time as you yeah. just said that it just showed the temperature on your video. Yeah. 103. You know, 
physically it was a little bit rough we, we actually even documented i was i was losing about like eight to ten pounds of water weight a day um oh and so God. like just staying hydrated because we were under a pretty tight deadline uh home depot spent more money on the production crew that was going to come and shoot everything when it was done than they did on my fee and on the on all the materials that were going into the house so they're bringing out a 30 person film crew to to do all these crazy video tours so we had to hit a really precise day um and permitting took longer than we expected so we're like okay we got 20 weeks no problem and then it kept getting down shorter and shorter and shorter and it, it got a little bit uh it got a little nerve-wracking but uh you know uh I got really good with an angle grinder and <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty decent at, at, at welding. So th that part was tricky, but really, I guess the, the thing that makes the whole process tricky is that you, you need, you know, we had to do uh, plywood sheathing on the inside of the two by four framing. And, you know, a container is, is, is eight foot wide from the, from the exterior. So, but if you factor in the corrugation, which is a few inches, and then you factor in ins insulation and then drywall and the, the half inch plywood sheathing, you're starting to get really close to seven feet, which is sort of minimum egress, uh, mm -hmm. kind of distance. So that was the kind of challenging part was getting enough insulation in there to meet title 24 for sort of California standards. Um, and you know, still having enough width, uh, <laughs> To, to, to make everything work from a egress and safety standard on the, on the interior design. Did you ever uh, research to see what was stored in those containers? It was so it's actually a great point. They, in California, if you're doing any sort of residence or inhabitable building, they have to be first run containers. So, and it's less about sort of toxic materials being in there, but much more about radioactive components. Exactly. So yeah. there's a, apparently there's a number of containers that occasionally in their, you know, thousands of trips across the ocean carry something that has sort of radioactive properties. So it's not uncommon uh, to find a container that's slightly radioactive uh, or has some sort of toxic. Other, and it's bringing yeah. other products over now until it right. gets decommissioned, which is crazy to me. Right. Um, like. <laughs> so for California and I think a few other states, you have to use a first run container. So that's another reason why the, you know, these sort of myths of you know, oh, you're recycling them. You're getting a container for, for really cheap. They're still not that expensive. I paid about 4,500 for the 40 foot high cube containers. So the high cubes are, have a lot of foot taller on the, on the ceiling, which is definitely nice because we have to do full sprinkler systems and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, $4,500 why, why you have to get to do, a, why'd you have to do full sprinkler? Uh, California. So oh, pretty okay. much every new residents does even though we're you know we're surrounded by concrete pavers and hmm. gravel roads and nothing combustible for about 50 feet away from the house sure. it doesn't matter uh so that was actually about uh yeah i think it was like four to five percent of the construction costs went to sprinklers um wow. yeah it's uh someone uh some someone's union did well in that sort of lobbying deal to, to make that the, the statewide regulation with no exceptions. Wow. So it, it's really about the complexity of, of the build. So what did, what did the home end up costing to build? Uh, right around 200,000, uh, just a little mm -hmm. under there. So, um, you know, it's only 720 square feet. So, you know, not, not inexpensive, but not too bad. It's also a little bit of a, of a mushy number because I didn't, I'm not really factoring in my own labor into that. And I did a lot of the steel work. So that probably would have been like another, like, you know, 10 grand or so in sort of labor, um, that was unaccounted for. Uh, my estimate would be if I was to do, and, and this is the number one question I get is like, what's the cost difference versus the same house stick built with like stucco or like fiber cement cladding. Mm -hmm. And I think the building with the containers would probably be about, 10 to 15 percent more um i was so hoping you were gonna say that's series two yeah <laughs> like the exact same uh, thing but stick built like yeah. next lot over <laughs> yeah so we're, we're actually working on a stick built house uh next it's gonna be same it's lot. gonna be inherently more efficient just because we're building the the surface to volume ratio will be less different 
this container house is three individual containers with open air, you know, it's like breezeway kind of walk through between them. Um, so the surface to volume ratio of like how much framing we had to use relative to the interior square footage is, is very inefficient, but we kind of like this idea of creating this like little village of, of cabins. Uh, it also lends itself really well to the primary aesthetic per, or uh, financial function of it, which is to Airbnb it. Um, hmm. So, you know, and you, you know, didn't, the typical you didn't... sort of Airbnb profile is like a, you know, a pair of couples coming out for a long weekend. They each get their own little cabin, just like a little patio and barbecue place in between. And it's a, uh, it's a lot of fun. And this didn't fall into like the tiny house, like new codes that came out. Uh, no. So when we, when we started the permitting process, we were originally just going to do two containers and, uh, there we found that there was a minimum square footage requirement of 700 square feet. So we added the third one just to meet that. Now, since then in California, they've uh, changed that requirement. So now I think you can build, I think it's over, the minimum is 400 square foot, uh, uh, square, 400 square feet in this location. So is the, the goal to build a bunch of cabins on this 10 acres or is it just the two? I think this is just going to be one and done for us. And uh, it's been doing really well on Airbnb. It's grossing of being anywhere between sort of five and 6,000 a month. Um, so, you know, we have it under management and that, that takes a, a big chunk of it. And the wear and tear of an Airbnb property is uh, pretty substantial, you know, uh, especially with like accordion doors and stuff like that. So it's, it's always like a good lesson for me as the sort of designer making all the decisions. I'm like, oh, okay, like I knew what I wanted to have these, you know, these uh, 11 foot accordion doors completely lined up. So you can just see all the way through the house and get this really nice money shot. Whereas you walk up to the house and someone's like entertaining, you can see right through the whole thing and into the landscape in the back. I knew that would be like a great shot that would do really well in the content. I also have used a, uh, you know, nano walls and different uh, accordion doors and, they're they're tricky you know the, the the tracks get jammed the hardware isn't always as resilient as it is with you know sliders or or you know french doors or stuff like that so um they've taken they've taken some abuse you know people just kind of like don't latch everything back into place they yank on the handles and uh so those things have taken a lot of uh sort of maintenance um we also used a lot of brand new products that were new to the market uh, we use like a flush mounted integrated mini split system. Traditionally, whenever I've used mini split, they've been, you know, the big honking thing on the wall. This mm -hmm. is when we actually drop the ceiling down and recessed it into it. So you just see like a very nice grill. It, it's mostly worked, but it's had a few sort of finicky ish uh, issues. We had a little bit of condensation dripping from it, but that kind of is what happens when you use something that hasn't been out there for multiple uh, cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, against my uh, protest, uh, used a smart shower thing from from Moen. I, I love Moen. I think they make great stuff. Never had any problem with them except for this one smart shower system. It's just a thermostatic valve is so smart and has no electronics. That's what I think actually makes it so smart. When you The minute you put a digital control uh. to something that has a perfectly good analog uh, alternative, uh, I don't think that's... I think that's complicated. So what's the partner? So you do a lot of partnerships. Oh. Would you say, before we jump to that, would you say from, obviously there was product donated and all that stuff. Would it, was it a financially feasible or successful product based on the return as of right now? Yeah. Uh, so for comparison, uh, the average HGTV show does about... I think like for their average shows are right around like 800,000 views for like a 22 minute episode and a, you know, one of their real, their, their best shows like Chip and Joanne or the property brothers, those will do like maybe like 1.5 million views. So we did, you know, almost double their numbers with, and instead of using a crew of 30 people to make the content, we used a team of three people. So there's inherently a ton of economic density around the content itself. So if we can reach that kind of audience with a 10th of the cost, uh, the content is is so valuable that it really wouldn't have mattered if we would have spent twice as much money on the construction. Um, 
the construction cost relative to the Airbnb performance is really just a bonus. What's really important is that you are influencing so many people's decisions on different products that they can then go and get from Home, Home Depot. Um, and our deal with Home Depot is that we'll use what you want, but we'll always speak about the products honestly. So if it's a product that we really love, we'll gush about it. If it's one that we think is a little bit too smart for its own good, we'll let people know that as well, but we'll recommend a different product from the same store or even from the same brand that would be, a, would be our preferred alternative. Um, so what we try to really show is that, you know, with traditional media, there's a separation between the creative and the advertising and with the way technology is going, I don't think that really makes a ton of sense. I don't sit and watch any commercials unless it's maybe the Super Bowl. I'm just going to fast forward right through them. And what we're doing is inherently instructive. We're not into the, the big, oh, you know, wait for the big reveal to see the before and after. We're not trying to joke around and be like really cute and folksy, uh, you know, with our, with our, our very fresh fit flannel shirts and our uh, very manicured <laughs> beards, right? What we're trying to say is what's valuable about what we do is that the people that watch it are interested in the actual information and the reasons why we've made purchases that result in, uh, you know, you know, big ticket items. So uh, the content is what's really valuable. And this, this is something I've been playing with all the way back uh, since I sort of moved away from architecture. With architecture, I was always incentivized to get wealthier and wealthier clients. It takes just as long to design an inexpensive house as it does an expensive one. You just get paid less. So the value in design as a service was in uh, doing fewer projects but with bigger price tags. And as someone that came from a you know a, uh, a relatively poor background, uh, I and and also realizing that there's way more people that are uh, financially strapped than there are you know uh, balling it. So uh, <laughs> I thought there's a big opportunity in, in in creating media content that focused on much more affordable things but not doing that as a service, simply doing that by publishing useful content. That's that's exactly what I wanted to get into. I think you had alluded to it there, but I think I read something or or some, I, I, maybe you posted something, but uh, specifically about the reason why you got out of architecture is because of that. And, you know, I'm, you know, for me, and I think a lot of us in, in this industry, we're always looking for a wealthier client because we want to be able to dump more time into what we're doing. And we right. want to and we want to build bigger homes and better homes and, and have people value it. And, and But the other side of me oftentimes challenges that and says, that's great. And like, I love, and I love doing that. And our clients are absolutely fantastic. But how do we, like, how can we scale that back to hit a bigger demographic and I and I make a reference to Benson Wood who you know they've automated the way they build homes and they've taken you know they've streamlined you know post and beam construction to make it more affordable which is I think incredible there he's basically cr increasing his market to you know let's call it the middle class and up where a lot of us are look, working for the upper class and you know the upper upper class and you just you had just said it in architecture it's the same thing it's like you want to you want to design really complex beautiful homes right so I, I i mean there is a trickle down aspect of innovation that comes from the high end of the market to the mm -hmm. low end of the market i mean we've seen that with so many different things i remember when like lutron those those lighting systems mm -hmm. and now like you can a accomplish pretty similar results with like i don't know a hundredth of the budget um, right so there, there is real trickle down and innovation does get proved out at the high end. It does trickle down for me. It wasn't like any sort of indictment. And I, I love the architecture we work that we did at the, the high end of the market. It's like, I learned so much from that. And I kind of think that it's like, when I talk to sort of uh, people that are in film, they'll often sort of do the, they'll do a movie for the studio that they know is going to make a lot of money. And then that kind of creates the room for them to do something that's more personal and creative to them. So it's sort of like one for them and then one for me. Gotcha. And for the first part of my career, that's, that's how I was sort of doing it. I would do a high end, you know, three to $5 million house design on Cape Cod. And then I would do a project in a developing country um, that, that was that, that I found really uh, exciting. 
And, you know, I don't, that, that kind of history of creative people uh, responding to their business model or having their creative pursuits dictated by the commission, that's not unique to, to our trades. I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at Renaissance art, it was selfies for rich people right? Like, you know, back in the day when they didn't have camera phones, uh, they would hire someone to do an oil painting of their, you know, whether it was the Medici family or something like that in Florence, like, okay, here's my daughter, paint her portrait, make her look better than she does. And (laughs) then we'll fund you so you can go off and experiment with your own weird inventions and stuff like that. So the history of all creative pursuits are often in, you know, have all been compromised by the nature of their business model. So once I started realizing that, it made me think that the way I can be more innovative as a designer and have more creative freedom is by sort of doing different experiments as an entrepreneur that change the structure of the commission. If I change the structure of the commission, how I get paid, it probably will have an impact on the creative work itself. And, uh, you know, it's kind of been the case. So now I'm sort of incentivized to make things as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have to worry about differentiating myself by out detailing every other furniture designer, interior designer, or architect. I don't have to become the most minimalist with the thinnest edge and trim on the windows to the point where I'm also really worried about leaks getting in, but it looks so clean and fresh in that sort of modern architecture magazine. No, I can, I can really design to exactly what I think is appropriate. And then it's just the burden of me in communicating why it's appropriate. And if I can do that, uh, it'll be both lucrative and useful to a pretty broad selection of people. So when you were developing, you were, you said you were developing projects in other countries. What, what, how were you finding, like, what, what was your path for that? Well, it was, it was early in the career. So we were saying yes to everything and, you know, the, the first project we ever landed as an architecture firm, and this is even before Stephanie was on full-time, Stephanie Horowitz, who now is the, the managing director of Zero Energy Design. Uh, we were friends in college. We were always like homework buddies. The first project I got was to design a very small like eco hotel in the middle of the rainforest in Dominica, not the Dominican how, Republic, different but island. How, but how, when, so how did we that were at about? some... We were doing consulting for GE's eco uh, eco home or eco imagination uh, home campaign, and we had to come up with some cool things and, and different ways to communicate the value of solar and better insulation. We were at this sort of uh, I think it was like I don't know if it was a green build or some builder show, and we did a presentation on uh, the the actual payback of solar and energy improvements to the consumer when you actually factor that into the mortgage and not just the sticker price. Um, we were doing a presentation on that and this guy that's from Dominica, uh, he's a lawyer that lives in DC, but he's from this little Island. And he's like, Hey, I have some land. I want to build this like eco resort thing. Cause they don't really have beaches of that kind of tourism. I think we took, you know, a full, uh, a design fee of about seven or $8,000 to do an incredibly complex building. But it was, uh, the building didn't come out that great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It was on a shoestring budget, uh, but I had I discovered one of the, the greatest tactile joys of my construction life is cutting through an entire banana tree with a really sharp machete. It's basically like a giant stalk of celery, and with one swoop of a machete, it just like cuts, and then it slowly just whole thing falls over. So uh, I got to go down there and clear the site to, to put in the stakes and, and lay it out because they didn't have any surveyors or, or anything like that. And it was a great experience and I learned a ton, um, but it wasn't really, uh, it was more adventure types ex- experiences. They weren't really transferable to, you know, the next project they did in the United States. So that's what I was just going to ask. How did that lead or what led you to the project in the U.S.? I, I just Cause you guys, this is your, this is yeah. your first project, right? So we st- right. So when, when I was in graduate school, uh, I started surveying other people that were in architecture school or they had gotten out in about five years uh, before and sort of said, where are you in your career now? Are you happy, unhappy? Like what's going on? And, you know, I, I was taking out a ton of student loans and I didn't want to have my future just be like, okay, you work for a firm and then you hope that somehow a client comes to you and then you leave the firm or, you know, how is right. that not a conflict of interest? 
So I started trying to map out how I was going to have my own firm right away. And in interviewing people that were all five years out of school, they were all working for other people or they were rich kids that could just enter competitions endlessly until they got one. Um, <laughs> so they were kind of playing to design the lottery. I'm like, well, I don't have that luxury. So I'm going to have to figure something else out. So, th you know, this was, uh, you know, 2005 ish. Um, and I started looking at all the websites of every architecture firm and they were all these like slow loading flash websites where like a line goes across the screen and then the text comes up and you're like five minutes of staring at, you know, really slow internet flash graphics. But what they were missing is that, uh, none of those flash kind of websites were doing that well, uh, uh getting indexed on search engines. So they were these funky little videos, but no one could find any text or, or really uh, uh, find them in those sort of primitive days of search engines. How did you, how, so, how did you know to, to look at that analytic data? Cause that was, I mean, that was, well, quite... I just did an inventory of, uh, of who I was going to compete against. Right. So mm -hmm. as a young person with no professional experience competing against the average residential architecture firm, it has like a 40 year old, uh, you know, head and I'm not going to beat them on knowledge of materials. I, I can probably beat them in speed of ca operating CAD software. Mm -hmm. uh, we heavily invested right away. As soon as Revit became available at, while we were students, we started learning that because we knew that it would make us more efficient. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, one advantage we can have is being better at rendering, better at 3d modeling, better at uh, sustainable design things because those weren't as prevalent back then. Green design was a pretty new thing. People just thought it was like bamboo floors and, and you know, passive solar stuff. Uh, so we knew that those were going to be our, our sort of technical advantages, but our marking advantage would be the internet. It just made sense because we didn't have another option. We didn't have great images. We weren't in magazines or any of these things. So we said, you know, if we don't have these things, what could we have? And that was the only thing we could find. So it became obvious that that's what we should invest in. So we focused on search engine optimization and just on our website, wrote a whole bunch about how to build a green home in New England, how to build a green home in upstate New York. We just wrote these kind of like basic blog posts on our, on our sites and would uh, volunteer to write things for like apartment therapy, uh, for all like the kind of home bloggy kind of websites back in the day and kind of built traffic that way. And our conversion rate was terrible, but we're competing against people that didn't know they were competing on this platform. Right. So we were winning commissions um, uh, precisely because people were finding us that were interested in sustainability and green design. Our, the profile of our first few clients uh, tended to be like engineers or chief scientific officers in the Boston area building a second vacation home. And the reason I think why we sort of were able to land jobs that maybe our experience didn't really justify otherwise was because uh, we were using energy simulation software at a time when it was highly unusual. We had in-house uh, HV or mechanical engineers, Jordan Goldman, working right alongside our, our architecture and design team. And we just told them, look, if you hire a different residential architecture firm, they're going to have way more experience than us. But the people actually doing the work are going to be our age anyways. It's just someone checking up on them. We'll make sure that we talk to our sort of peers and advisors to get that kind of experienced, uh, you know, uh, input. But what you are going to get is all of us working way harder than these kind of older, more established firms. For them, it's just one more project. And here's the technology that we're using relative to energy modeling, relative to uh, 3D design tools that just make more sense. And I think, you know, still, I think even today, because we have this more kind of engineering heavy approach to uh, sustainability and aren't just kind of like bamboo floors and reclaimed, um, it tends to appeal to people with sort of a scientific background. And in the New England and Boston area, there's a lot of people that do quite well for themselves with that background. So that, so ultimately you're competing against other, other architects in a space that they don't know that you're competing right. or they're, that they're competing in you're winning projects based on that. You're, you're the, selling them on the fact that you're young, hungry, can work harder and have the technology. And that's kind of how it, you, you, you started up in the U S 
Yeah, and 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 I see the same kind of story playing out with the younger generation. So, uh, one of the groups that I am an advisor to is the AO5 Studio out of out of uh, Brooklyn, and you know they're former architecture students that got really good at digital fabrication, and so I helped them find their, like their first clients, and now they're sort of booming and expanding, and they're competing against these other sort of fabrication firms that you know are a lot older, and they're you know, they've been using uh, uh, CNCs and 3D printers since they were teenagers. So right. there's, there's there's sort of a built-in uh, competency for these kind of digital fabrication tools. And once they sort of, you know, got steady on the client parts and could start keep reinvesting into the business, it's just sort of off to the races for them. So, I th- you know, whenever whenever I talk to young people getting into any of the trades, it's, it's, learn everything you can from the people older than you because that information is is real and irreplaceable but don't forsake everything that's inherent to your sort of generation in terms of outside tools that could be brought into this um and for my generation that was much more sort of early website and search engine optimization for the for the 22 or 23 year olds getting into the trade right now probably going to be something much more closer to social media podcasting or something like that and it's, as you so as you continue to grow, obviously your clientele, like this is the path of, you know, getting more and more wealthy clientele, right? Uh, no, it's going to be more and more development, right? So our next big project is we just raised a uh, capital. No, I'm, I'm sorry, not now. Oh, I mean, yeah, uh, in, in, in your in the storyline here <laughs> yeah. is that you're you're starting to get these clients and you, you realize that you're starting to you know, do more complex design and getting paid more for it. And then you're getting paid more for it. So the homes get bigger and they become more expensive and, and kind of snowball from there. So how long, how yeah. long did you Do you think that your product was in line with what these older, um, more experienced architects were offering? Um, from a sort of aesthetic design standpoint, yes. From an energy standpoint, it was way beyond what they could, they could ever quantify. Uh, they could not prove how additional inf- insulation would actually impact either carbon emissions or utility bills. We could. Uh, and then afterwards, we would actually document it and then show our next client, here's what we predicted. Here's what happened. We know what we're doing. Ask your other sort of, you know, 55 to 60 year old, you know, uh, principals of an architecture firm, if they know how to do that. And if they don't don't know how to do that, that means they're just trying to hire young people like us that do know how to do that. But the decision making is coming from someone that doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, so we are really aggressive and kind of undermining that yeah, kind I mean, of that, older generation. That's a bold so where, did, where did the, I feel like, so looking at it from my perspective, when I started my company, there was very little experience. So I feel like that experience came naturally and it was very organic growth. And I didn't necessarily ever put myself in a position where I felt I was in over my head. But I, I also feel that I needed that very slow, consistent growth and experience to get where I eventually wanted to be. And it almost seems like you kind of skipped over that. So where was the experience coming from to handle these jobs that maybe you wouldn't have necessarily been getting had you just taken like a a more standard or typical approach um because i I do feel like with design a lot of it is making mistakes and designing more and more projects where you're learning that stuff so experience is invaluable but you can also accelerate how you get experience so one of the things again when i sort of uh, interviewed all these people that were older than me when i was in college is they they said oh when i graduated I didn't know anything about construction. I didn't know how to actually, how to do a building. I knew how to do renderings and do diagrams and theoretical designs. I didn't know how to design a basic house. So what I wanted, me and Stephanie did is we founded the original solar decathlon team. So we actually brought a design build project into our curriculum at Cornell. And then we led that. So it was a two and a half year process where we had a completely student led team of 70 architects, engineers, urban planners, biologists, pretty much people from every discipline on campus. And we actually brought in what we weren't going to get out of our actual education to make sure that we're getting 
into that cycle earlier. So from Wait, that, hold on. St- I, I'm going to pause you for a second because we talked about the solar decathlon with um, Ma, Kyle. Yeah, Ma. So you, you I'm going to back up. You said that you found it or you- founded it, the Cornell team. Oh, the so, Cornell team, not the yeah. solar decathlon. No, th- th- we entered. I think it was the second one that had ever been done, and everyone Do you know else. Kyle? That, uh, probably I like if I to, saw him. Where did he go? to Penn State. Uh, I'm not sure. Mott Mot Architecture. I'm saying that probably. Mott right. Architecture M- sounds familiar. M A H T. M A C M A C H T. Kyle's listening He's to this. From like Pennsylvania. you guys. <laughs> I feel like he went to Penn State. Um, okay. So you, so, because he had a similar story where that's how he really got into it is by entering into this, this competition that really, I mean, we, we we went down a rabbit hole about talking about how budget didn't even matter on, on these things. It was strictly about building the most, you know, well thought out and and design home. That's how every team approached it except our team. And that was me and Stephanie's decision. We said that, that, you know, gratuitous excessive design just to sort of say that you're doing something technologically innovative wasn't that interesting to us so we ended up coming in second the only team that beat us is because they i think outspent us by about 3x on just solar panels and batteries and that was such a big component of the competition but we said doing any sort of design that is talking about sustainability that's not focused on uh reproducible cost is kind of irresponsible um particularly because in that time frame, it wasn't like people were inventing brand new technology and getting it UL listed and then brought to market. They were kind of like cobbling together things from off the shelf components and then a little bit of, you know, maybe a new control interface or something like that. So we said, if that's not the case and we're not gonna build a Stirling engine from scratch and not use photovoltaics and instead use like solar thermal and then convert to electricity there, which would be a major sort of technological difference, we're going to be using kind of commercially available photovoltaics. Let's focus on cost and repro- uh, and making designs that are reproducible and useful, not just trying to make this hot rod that's like a cool showpiece, you know, mm-hmm. like a science fair. Um, so that got us to we were the only student-led team. We uh, we had no advisors because adv- our faculty advisors originally were were more interested in the theoretical, and we we're like, look, we get plenty of that in our other classes. This is the one area where we want to focus on practical stuff. And it was our first introduction to project management, uh, construction management, actually building stuff, welding, um, learning about expansion and contraction, learning how to the sort of stages of constructions and the, the challenges of how things sort of get layered and how it's really hard to finish one task because you need this other thing from this thing. So that wherever possible, we would try to interject experience uh, in the most precocious way possible, like kind of ahead of a natural timeline. So yeah, you, you, you can't fake experience, um, but you can sort of speed up the timeline for how you're sort of getting it. And you can also look at like that kind of natural timeline and look where people are getting redundant experiences. You don't need to do the same thing for 10 years to have experience. You might only need to do it for two years if you're a, a quick learner. And I think what a lot of people do is they they do they gather experience passively instead of actively. They don't make a list of saying, To get to my goal, here's all the types of experience I need. They sort of say, well, I'll work for these people for five or 10 years and then see what's up. Um, And if you're you're fine sort of, you know, leaving your future uh, up to someone else's fate, go for it. That works great. But if you really want to try to get ahead of the timeline um, and don't and, and 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 in my case, I always had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder if I felt like I was competing against all these wealthy kids that could have their parents commission their first building. Um, So I always felt like I had to do that. And that even translated to when I did my first development in Boston. So I was, you know, all my money was going into this project. I bought uh, land in Jamaica Plain. I looked for wherever new Whole Foods were going in and then tried to find uh, vacant lots near them. So I bought a... It was zoned for two units because the the, the footprint was pretty small, um, right near Jackson Square in, in Jamaica Plain. And uh, all my money went into that piece of land and you know spent about a year getting variances to, to up it to uh, a three unit building. And when I had to pick the general contractor, I was like, man, I really have to trust them because my entire net worth and uh, you know 
in addition to some some loans from some friends and family is going into this project like this cannot fail uh, why did, what was your i don't want to skip over that because it's so important is that you you're investing literally more than you had at this point and what was the driving force behind it because you the, you're 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 at this point an established firm right zero yeah. energy is established you're you're bringing in you're bringing in income what was this just strictly a passion project? It was a chance to sort of have the business side double that year instead of growing 20% that year. Um, so it was it was strictly sort of uh, trying to increase the economic velocity to give myself more options to not be just sort of always working for someone else. Um, even though you know my name's on the firm and I'm a co-founder, you're still sort of very client driven. Um, and I'm like, if I can be my own developer, I can say no to more clients simply by, you know, substituting in my own projects. Um, and also I thought that the land was a remarkable opportunity. And I just, you know, my, my timeline got accelerated when I found that lot near where a new Whole Foods was opening up. So in trying to pick the, the construction firm, I sort of narrowed it down to Place Taylor, which at that time was a pretty young firm in, in Boston. But like I, I knew the guys, I knew that they seemed very ethical um, I didn't want them to know I was planning on hiring them. So I said, Hey, I want to work for you guys for a summer. I want to just be part of the building crew. And, uh, they were doing s buildings that were similar to the one I wanted to build. So while I was sort of doing the design and permits, uh, at night, I was actually working full on as a construction worker for them. And it got me to see what they were doing well, what I thought could be improved, what kind of design decisions uh, were working well for them. And they were doing, you know, passive house level, level construction. Um, and that kind of hands-on experience, it changed about a, a bunch of things about the way I designed the building. Um, right away, it made me think like, oh, I was doing my siding details all wrong. I thought that having these, you know, four foot by eight foot fiber cement panels would reduce the amount of cuts but it, you know, you need two guys to hold those into place and then another guy to, 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 to drive the screws. Right. So seeing that kind of stuff in real time, let me sort of understand design at a different level than when you're just working in Revit. And, uh, it also made me sort of see where they were kind of getting held up, uh, towards finishing. And it made me sort of realize how hard it is to finish a project. It's you sort of surge your way to about 85 to 90%, but that last 10% can just take forever. And, when I, uh, so the big decision I made from that was, uh, I actually had them for the lofts, uh, it, it changed my design from doing them as apartments to lofts. So a lot more open space, way fewer doors to hang. I left off things like baseboards for one of the units. I didn't have them do any of the kitchen cabinets or stuff like that. And then I just came in and did all open shelving, uh, and made my own concrete countertops to kind of save money. So I could kind of see firsthand by sort of working for them before I hired them uh what kind of things i wanted to change in the design so i mean that's it's an interesting approach so you were working as a construction but also had this firm were you designing other projects like client projects at this time no no i had taken leave from from uh zero energy at that time and was focusing on the development and on getting a homemade modern started so i was still that was when I started sort of producing YouTube videos and stuff did like you, that. Did you win the lottery at one point? No, just save my money, work that's, a lot. <laughs> I mean, that's, um, and, it, and we it, got it, that, we got that plot for, you know, it was only zoned for two units. We got it for a hundred thousand. Um, wow. you know, and oh, that's a steal. I know and J, it was, JP went through the roof. Yeah. Uh, we're, I think we're, we're actually selling, I sold one of the units. So it's a three unit building. We got the variance to go from two units to three units. And we also got a nice variance on the FAR. And we actually used a lot of sustainable design considerations. And we actually showed that our three unit building would use less resources than a typical two unit building built to sort of basic code. Um, and then we also said, look, we're you know very close to public transportation. Um, we can deed an electric car into the condo association to discourage like car ownership. So we really pulled out all the bells and whistles and sustainability sort of gimmicks uh, to, to not pass on cost to the consumer or try to make a higher margin building in terms of what you sell or, or, or rent, but as a way to get concessions from the city for variances. 
which so I still said, think is like business wise the smartest way to use sustainable design. So you said you, you sold one of them. We sold one of them right away, uh, even before we finished construction, uh, and that paid back almost all of the construction loan. <laughs> and we're I think we're going to sell another one right now. That the people that bought the that first unit, uh, they want to buy the other unit and kind of slowly take over the building. When was this built? Uh, let's, we finished it in like I think like twenty. 2014 2015 oh, 2015 so recently yeah why didn't you hire nick i think nick. he's out of our price range <laughs> <laughs> he was, no he wasn't back then yeah been fine so you were with zero energy design for how many years uh i haven't been with them for a long time i i, I so i also in between zero energy design and homemade modern which is sort of my media company now i did a startup called free green which yeah. for a while was the largest player supplier of stock house plans in in the country and what we basically saw is that about 30% of the new single family homes in America come from stock house plans. So like houseplans.com, I think is the, the biggest uh, supplier. And you know, they're like eight to 10 page PDF drawing sets and they, they cost 500 to a thousand dollars for a drawing set. So it's all well, your you, fault. You, yeah, you so, work, you work for them. <laughs> no, I, I founded free green and I, and we saw that they, what houseplans.com was doing was pretty just not great. And we said, let's create really efficient uh, designs that sort of at that time you couldn't find just like, uh, unless it was like buildingscience.com, you couldn't find good uh, super insulated details or it was like some sort of real hippie kind of like earthship type building. And what we did is we raised a ton of capital uh, in 2007. Uh, we won like the, the all Ivy league business plan competition, me and my business partner, Dave Wax. And we raised a bunch of money and said, you know, green design is going to be the future. Uh, started producing a whole bunch of these sort of smaller, more energy efficient, reasonably affordable homes and gave them a, those designs away for free online along with all the building details. And then we sold advertising directly into the designs themselves. So instead of what we said is that like nobody hires architects at the low end of the market. Um, so they're getting it from house plans. So let's make even, even the middle. <laughs> Or yeah. higher, <laughs> right. right? So we were designing homes that you know could be built for about two hundred thousand. Um, oh man, you said house plans. Yeah. This entire time, I thought you said house plants. Oh no. And I'm sitting, <laughs> I'm sitting here, and I'm like, who the hell sits there and thinks like about house what no. runs through your mind on any given day that you like found a need for house plants and I'm, I'm thinking like <laughs> I need to hire you to come up with some sort of idea to make money for me if you found a need through houseplants.com you'd have to be smoking those house plants to yeah to and I'm sitting valuable. here and I'm like I'm like what how did your brain ever come up with like there's a need that people have for house plants and they need plans for them now it, it, it I was, am tired it was really seeing the limitations of architecture as a service industry it's like I think it's only like five percent of the homes like directly involved a custom service architect uh no you know, i get it now this all batches. makes it yeah. was not making sense to me before when i was thinking house plants i was yeah. I and we were, we were also thinking about just like if you're an insulation company it's really hard to advertise right like if you're looking at dwell magazine you're not like wow look at this sexy in insulation that is <laughs> that's a nice looking foam right like no, you I, just I, would. It. I yeah, would. I mean, the, the building geeks do. <laughs> yeah. Architecturally um, exposed foam. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, specking that right into a design and then showing energy modeling to explain why a particular insulation might be better than, you know, fiberglass vat is a great way to market and sell insulation because they're not just seeing it. one, it's already baked into the recipe that you're handing your contractor. Sure, they can substitute it out if appropriate, but they tend to sort of just follow the what's already specced into the drawings. And it allowed us to, you know, to give away documents that were valuable for free and really work with these kind of, uh, you know, these more invisible building product companies that were struggling to find great ways to market. 2008 happened and really hurt us because our all our revenue was in construction and advertising for construction so the construction industry took a massive hit obviously in 2008 but the marketing budget is the first part to go for that so we really struggled in like 2008 to 2010 kind of built it back up and then eventually sold it to houseplants.com as hanley wood i think it was 
uh, was sort of rolling up all the houseplant companies. Did a lot of architects hate you? The dumb ones. Uh, anyone that was actually <laughs> uh, reasonably intelligent uh, would see that, uh, you know, we were working at the type of the market that they weren't addressing. Right. So anytime someone said to us, said, oh, well, yeah, well, are you going to design for these people? Because you can have this commission. We'll, we'll funnel them right to you. If you want to design something that sells for $500, go right ahead. And the house plan market had been there forever. Right. You know, and there were some architects that made a really good living designing stock house plans. Um, yeah. And those were the ones that were probably, you know, the most annoyed, but we were doing the same thing they were doing with just a different financial model. Um, but it's not dissimilar to like the idea of selling music versus like streaming services. Uh, we saw it as sort of like an inevitable experimentation or shift in the market. We didn't think it yeah. would become the dominant trend and it hasn't. Um, that made a lot of people very angry. Only the dumb ones. Again, anyone the, that was the, actually the music industry. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the market's kind of undefeated and, uh, you know, whining against the inevitability of technology. If it makes you feel better, you know, go for it, you know, be, be the old man in the rocking chair. Um, but what I always tell people is like, you don't have to be that person and it's never too late to take advantage of inevitable technological trends. So when you were at Zed, did you, I, I think I read somewhere that you did a couple pro bono designs that were kind of smaller scale. Is that where the initial idea for that came up? Was yeah. to kind of. So we did, uh, we won a US GBC uh, design competition to do affordable housing for Katrina victims. That's right. And we, we you know, my partners in the firm really support the, the ideals behind those projects, but they're like, okay, can't, can't take away from billable hours. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, we did it. I mean, I, I love the design we came up with. We, you know, it was, it was way more of a vernacular design than what we typically do. Uh, but you know, we were, we we're even saying, okay, there, in, in general for this kind of framing, there'll be this percentage of off cuts of two by fours and that we'll actually design the kitchen cabinets to be made out of the off cuts, you know, any concrete left over from the foundation, let's, precast in like the patio slabs and you know exterior things so every little bit of waste can get sort of extended and let's work in some some really cool diy uh design ideas so that you know there may not be the budget for really great closet organizers from you know california closets or something like that but people still aspire to that of all economic levels so let's just at least empower them and like leave some extra materials and some extra tools on site so we really thought that this hybrid you know Labor is a big component of building cost. Mm -hmm. So if you want to work at the low end of the market, empowering people to do a little bit of their own labor is, a, is one way you can potentially offset some of that cost. So we were trying to bake those designs in. The nonprofit it was an offshoot of the Salvation Army that was funding them. They had a bunch of scandals and internal trouble, cut the budgets dramatically, and ended up building like 70% of what we designed. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the point where I realized that like, I, if I'm going to do something that I think is, you know, interesting and I'm super passionate about like giving up some sort of authority or, you know, not having autonomy to actually pursue it the way I want to is incredibly frustrating. And that project, even though I felt so good about winning the competition, so good about the design we entered and still happy that somebody got a house out of this, um, it just left me saying like, I, I got to do things on my own terms and I'm not going to be able to do that unless I figure out a way to make that financially sustainable through some sort of innovative business model. I mean, that's been, you've had deep roots in that kind of philosophy you know, from then all the way to today. Lots know? of failures, lots of experiments and just, uh, but just being stubborn and, 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 you know, not, uh, stubborn on the important things and, you know, flexible on the the things that don't really matter i feel like you were there when we were we were trying to woo you guys when i was with a different company i was with boston green building oh yeah 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 with brian butler and yeah. we, were, we yeah. always kept trying to get on your radar we kept meeting with steph or whatever else steph is a beast man that yeah she is the toughest like one of the most knowledgeable people yeah. in the construction industry she's scary. i've seen yeah and she's she's just a the, the tiniest little demure looking 
just like quiet person. Um, but I've seen her just like tear into some co general contractors and it's, it's delightful because there's, there's <laughs> some that kind of, they'll look at her, they'll make all the wrong, like, wrong assumptions and sort of call her sweetie or something condescending. Oh God. They'll just take them to task on every single thing that they're doing, correct their terminology. It's a, it's a joy to watch. But I mean, your whole firm kind of had that image like that you uh, guys were just on point so knowledgeable because there wasn't anyone else out there building to the caliber like that kind of I want to say encompass of design and efficiency back then yeah we, we had like a having an in-house mechanical engineer that and, and it's not just having an uh I, th I think the thing that was important was that Jordan was considered an equal to the principles in the, on the architecture side. And just collaborating isn't just putting people with different knowledge bases into the room, because if there's one knowledge base that has sort of hierarchy over them, the other people's considerations can kind of get glossed over. It's really important to have like equal buy-in and those really productive arguments where, you know, uh, you know, I think, I don't think me and Stephanie ever had, like a single argument over like five or six years. She would get annoyed with me because I tend to be a little bit more idealistic, uh, a little bit more verbose and uh, uh, head in the sky. And she's just all nuts and bolts and practicality. Um, but that's ultimately what makes a, a pretty strong team is that the, the differences aren't the point of conflict they're the point of where you listen to people. Um, and there'd be so many times where I thought like, oh, I, what if we did the, the section this way through the building so that the hot air vents there and Jordan be like, yeah, but that doesn't make a statistically relevant difference. I'm like, but, but, but he's like, it just doesn't. I modeled it. Want me to run the numbers again? <laughs> and it was just like, it's the opposite of what happens in architecture school where you sort of like try to come up with a big idea and you keep pushing that idea, even if it's not, doesn't actually work when it applies to numbers. And that's why there's so many things like, well, the, the idea was this. And you're like, but the building is not great. Um, so it was, I think, you know, to, to be honest, I think uh, that kind of approach let us make very responsible buildings, but it probably kept us off the covers of some of the more avant-garde architecture magazines. So it made us like more like a really good high-end, uh, you know, great service firm, but you know, we're not going to win the Pritzker anytime soon with zero energy design. We're not going to be considered one of the, you know, the best architecture firm for architecture with a capital A as a type of art. Um, so we'll still make huge uh, inroads in the sort of uh, home design, uh, you know, sustainability categories, building science and all those things. But it's much more of being like a character actor than it is being like a, a star in the kind of environment that we were educated in. I mean, the, the we talk about it, and John, I, I made reference to this, I think, last week about, like, Zillow, right? When homes are advertised and how everything is, you know, square footage and the size of, you know, how many bedrooms and, and you know. It, it shows you what the market thinks is valuable. Not right, yeah. and not what, and what I, like, on Zero Energy's website, it's like they talk about the house and the build and what it is, but it, then it's the performance. And you right. keep alluding to the performance and how that is so important to the overall design, not only from the efficiency side, but you, the cost consideration. And right. I think that's what I find most interesting about you is the uh, it's there's a huge consideration for cost and how something, you know, even, you know, homemade modern, it's furniture typically, right? Right. And it's, you know, and you're basically proving that it, it can be inexpensive and beautiful. Right. And I think that's where, like, the, the home side of it is that's where, you know, I struggle with. It's like, w I think in our, in our industry, we are, we're all, again, we're always chasing the bigger clients, the better homes, the, the more elaborate homes, the, the ones that we can spend a ton of time on, where it's like, if... Well, you can be challenged the most. Right. Too. Yeah, and, but is it the, like, is the answer, in your opinion, Ben is the answer on the design side where it's making all of these considerations prior to construction 
So there's act there's when you are designing something that's beautiful, that's sustainable, that is really efficient, but you're also doing it in a manner that you're you're cost considerate. So I, I think the I, I don't have like a like a single master theory on it, but I know what kind of I think where the, the flaws are. And I just more about me trying to avoid what I see as pitfalls than it is trying to come up with like the perfect formula. So for example, I think when with a lot of the builders and architects that I, that I talk to, they look, they sort of size up a client economically. They're like, okay, they're probably in the $250 a square foot. And this client's probably more in the $350 a square foot sort of price class. And then what they do is they kind of uniformly make, you know, uh, recommendations on materials, appliances, finishes to meet that kind of class. So that would be like saying like, okay, my, I got to get a new wardrobe. Uh, I have, you know, somebody may have Banana Republic money and someone may have like Hugo Boss money, but they just go there and they buy everything. Which is more. Right. But No, what, which is more. Uh, Hugo Boss Banana. way more, right? <laughs> okay. So the, the value is in sort of mixing and matching what's actually important and spending a lot on important things and spending a little, even if it's a high-end project, on the things that aren't needle movers. But what happens, I think, so much is that things just get spread universally. And to, to make a more universal sense of, you know, I think the four of us probably aren't the most, you know, we're all in, in, relatively in the trade, so probably not the most fashion-forward people. If you, if you were to go to the grocery store with nothing in your refrigerator and you're having someone over and you can, uh, it'd be cheaper to make them a, a meal with a steak and just one vegetable than it would be to buy all the ingredients for everything you need for a burger. Because with the burger, you're going to end up with a lot of leftover ingredients. You're going to end up with a, you know, a half used uh, a jar of ketchup, uh, you know, some pickles, uh, you know, half the tomato that isn't used. So the, the burger can actually cost more, even though it's considered a lower end food item. So whenever I'm talking about sort of, you know, smart ways to approach cost, it's really differentiating uh, what's important to that particular client. And if you're building like a, a or Cape Cod is a great example, when we build these sort of big beach houses and we talk to the couple and we'd be like, well, tell us how you're actually going to use it for the whole year. And they go for, well, you know, as a couple, we'll go down there for sort of long weekends and probably at least once a month to kind of get away from the city. And then like three or four times a year, you know, we'll fill up all six bedrooms and have like our extended family out there. So what you don't want to do is be like, okay, you're at the 350 square foot price point. Let's just use all ANSAC stuff and all really nice bathrooms. Those bathrooms for like the, you know, fifth and sixth guest room, they're going to use once or twice a year. Those can be like white subway tile, real clean, classic. It'll always look good. It'll always work well. Kohler level, you know, uh, water fixtures, perfectly good. Great warranty, perform well, look decent. But then let's take that money we saved on these things that aren't used very much and let's pile that into something that you thought that is is really what you want, right? That, that you will be using every single weekend that you're out there. And that's how we try to think about everything is economic resources are always limited, no matter how big the budget is. So the more you think sort of just generically about sort of sizing them up, which is a totally necessary thing to kind of consider as you're sort of feeling out where this client's going to be. Um, but it doesn't mean you spread that money evenly across all considerations. Um, you know, for, for my own sort of, uh, you know, taste for my own designs, like there's a lot of things that I like that are really cheap. Like I like exposed edge plywood, uh, and it doesn't even have to be like Baltic birch or the fancy stuff. I like sanded pine plywood. Donald Judd used it in like all sorts of like famous pieces of artwork and made these really simple minimalist sofas. So we know this stuff for $30 a square foot can get aesthetic recognition at the highest levels of art and design. Uh, so why not sort of apply that for towards all the things we're designing and mix in the really special things that are incredibly well made and crafted with the low hanging fruit that might not cost much at all, but still can be really amazing. I think that, I mean, that, that takes a special kind of thought, right? Like most of us are looking at and going back to uh, your prescription comment from earlier it's like we're looking at what's normal what you typically use for this what you typically like what material would you typically in you know consider for something where exposed plywood it's like you know 
it is cheaper or, or it can be cheaper. And, yeah. you know, you don't have to buy, you know, to speak to furniture, you don't have to buy the sofa. You don't have to right. buy, you don't have to use a particular product. The cola fixtures over something nicer in the master. I think that's, you know, I think that's really relatable, at least in um, our sense is that, you know, and, and John and Tyler are probably similar where it's like, there's usually like in these bigger projects, there's always like a room that you can scale back on. It's right. like, hey, I want to re- do a great master bed uh, bathroom, and we're gonna do the guest bathroom over as well. But I just want to just, I just want to, you know, a refresh. Right. And it's just the con- the consideration for that again goes back to my comment of thinking that it has to be in the beginning. Like this right. has to be a consideration in the beginning. And I and I'm curious at how that ties to the mechanical side. Like having a mechanical engineer, we've worked with one on a handful of projects. And it's incredibly helpful because we're getting a little bit more data, data going into it and a little bit more confidence behind what we're proposing. But at the same time, it's, you know, the, the opportunity to cost compare, you know, and making sure we're not over, over designing a system. Right. So one of the things with mechanical engineering and way to communicate its value that I found has been useful over the years is. If you just tell someone that hasn't thought too much about HVAC that like, hey, we're going to spend more to give you this better system, they'll be kind of be like, all right, do I do I need that? You know. But if you say, hey, wouldn't it be amazing if you could uh, you could fall asleep at like, you know, sixty seven or sixty eight degrees, nice and cool, lowers your body temperature, helps you fall asleep faster. But whatever you set your iPhone to as an alarm it'll start to slowly raise the temperature of the room. So when you do wake up, the room is like 72 to 76 degrees. So you're you're feeling like even in the winter, you're ready to get out of bed, put your bare feet onto a warm radiant heating floor, uh, and then go take a shower, right? Like, will that save five to 10 minutes off your routine? Maybe, but when you, if you just explain, hey, we're gonna put in a, 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 you know, an HVAC system with this HERS rating, people are kind of like, Okay, but when well, you start to paint it into yeah. their values, yeah, they, it's a vision. It, they tend you're, to get more excited. You're explaining the vision of they're at that point. It's kind of right. like they're closing their eyes and picturing the scenario that you're you're explaining of them going to sleep nice and comfortable, waking up, and it's like they're ready. They're ready for the day. They can relate to that, not the fact that it has a better hertz rating. Right. I think right. that and we don't really get excited about pr- price point or technology by itself. Like if someone, I would be, if someone sort of said, Hey, I found the best taco truck in downtown LA. It's only here at these amount of times. It's like $4 for the taco. And if they really sell that and really paint the picture and it's like, this is the guy that makes it. I'm just as excited to go to that as I am to like a new David Chang restaurant or, or, or some celebrity chef. It can, it can still be that moment of joy and discovery and, and uh, yeah, and enjoyment. Uh, even if it's on the lower end of the spectrum, if you kind of tell the story of it and not just telling a story to sell it, but actually find a thing that's, you know, that's worth telling at the low end of the market. That that connects to them because most of the time, like I found that as I've gotten older, I found that like people tell you something, certain things like, Hey, we have this amount of budget. So you really value that. And then like, I remember when I did a renovation for one of my old hockey coaches and we did the whole basement so they could do a, um, they could do a, um, childcare in there and I'm like oh great so I get in the best deal and then like at the end he's like hey we just bought a place in New Hampshire and I was like wait wait a minute like like my values were all thrown off by that whole scenario where I thought I was giving them the best bang for their buck but they actually had more money in the bank and then as my career has gotten more legs it's like most people will still spend like crazy money on audio like the right. nice TVs the speakers all that stuff and then it's because they understand that they they mm-hmm. they understand the entertainment the the value that that brings to them personally for a movie for their family it brings them together so it's the same thing if you can paint that picture early on about the comfort and what this does like certain windows you know it's the level of windows have you ever had like a slider that doesn't open right every family's had that it's like well right. this is why we do this as soon as you make that connection with them they're like mm-hmm go with that. I don't care what the cost is as right. long as I can open it with my thumb right. and not like yank it with both hands. That's it. So it is those little things, but understanding the values personally is kind of a huge, huge thing in that, 
that component. Yeah. So one, one of my favorite ones is, uh, or there's sort of two examples that are kind of unusual. People get really excited about them or hate the idea completely, right? So one is doing a urinal in the master uh, 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 bathroom. I'm, I'm finally right? doing two. Yeah. No, like from now on, all of my houses are having one. Like one, it's actually a <laughs> fantastic way to save water. Like they use way less water. And if, that's a lot of what the, the toilet is, is used for. If they have more than two boys yeah. and a husband, I mean, it's oh, almost yeah, for, like a, for it any has family to. with a lot of boys, like it makes so much that's better aim, like all these things. Like it's it's a huge value add. It but it, it like I swear when you suggest it to people, they look like you suggested putting a helicopter landing pad. Like at least the wife does. The wife's right. like, What? But then but then I would say most people sort of go, oh, I don't know. But about twenty to thirty percent people like love the idea and they're like and and, and once those that group hears it they can't unhear it right that 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 has to be it um so that's one of my favorite one the other one is putting in two dishwashers which is which is a more common one um when you look at like the cost of like what a high-end cabinet is versus a dishwasher and if they're right next to each other that it's, it's you know not that much more installation work is still a little more plumbing and, and rough ends and stuff like that but if you are somebody that likes to entertain and as soon as i hear that i often suggest that you know right away and again, it's one of those things where the people that like it, it, it totally bonds you to them because they feel like you're really seeing them for how they live and who they are. Hundred um, percent. And when you actually explain about how much of a cost difference, like that's it. Right. Uh, no, but not even the cost. Like if you tell them like on a Wednesday or Thursday after a crazy week of sports school and all that, and the dishes have piled up from the four previous yeah. days, when they have a home in the dishwasher on the second one, it it doesn't they, the, the the missus usually or the husband goes we're doing that right like yeah. as soon as you paint that picture they're yeah. like so no dishes i don't have to walk in and be reminded of that chore yep that's the big then like, you same have as laundry. to unload too you got kids oh for that you, you can teach kids to unload dude you don't teach What's them to do dishes than what, loading what two dishwashers unloading to know I, I mean i don't know my boys do it you, now you but batch it older. out um, <laughs> laundry room same kind of thing if, yep. if if somebody has more than than uh three kids like i often suggest you know doubling up on the the, the laundry systems it just allows uh everything to get processed a lot quicker and it's funny when you bring up these things and even though the the client in a lot of cases is driving and making the ultimate decisions they still need almost permission to mm. do some things because they they, they still feel that like, well, I don't know too much about this. I've never commissioned a home before. And I think one of the, one of the great opportunities in the service when we're in these sort of trades and performing as a service provider, it's sort of not just saying yes to whatever they want, which I think is what the sort of standard is. It's sort of like, you know, giving them a few new ideas and challenging a little bit of conventions to get an even better fit than what they assumed. And when I, what the, one of the clients that's always been, uh, you know, still sends me like Christmas cards and stuff. You know, we did a really nice uh, renovation to their mid-century modern home in Lexington, uh, you know, just outside of Boston. But the part that they always bring up, we did all these cool design features and like sourced really nice materials and all that stuff. The thing uh, that they like the most that they, whenever I see them, they always bring up as just being so thankful for is we just reorganize their morning routine. So it's a, it's a, it's two women in the couple and they both, uh, one has like a hair press to like flatten out her, her hair. And the other one has an electric toothbrush. So in their, before we renovated it, one was unplugging one thing to plug in another thing and then put that thing down in the, in the, the drawer below, open up a cabinet. Uh, they had a mirror cabinets and we put all the plugs for all the things and they kind of uh, put pegboard in the back of these uh, uh, mirrored nets. We lined up the doors so that they could each, you know, look into a mirror without having any, you know, seams of the mirrors and their hair dryers and electric toothbrush could all stay in the cabinets, all plugged in, already charged. And that it only is saving them maybe 30 seconds. But right. When you when you do that every single day and it's just streamlined, that's such a better way to start. When if you have a commute to work and you hit green lights, like how valuable it'd be to always hit green lights just first thing in the morning. Dude, it just how, gets you that momentum and, and and that's enjoyment of design. No, how how about I'm in my yard, 
you know, where the, where the chops are on a table saw out, but I was lazy to put one cord out. So yeah. every time I go to use the chop saw, I got to then <laughs> unplug the table saw. Like, dry, I, on my own fault, I'm screaming at myself in the driveway right. last weekend. Like, go I'm get like, the three-way that's yeah, hanging on the back wall. I, I'm of the looking ground. at the cord, but no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep unplugging because I only need one more cut. And it's, That's why I have so, like six dust extractors because I'm like, I'm not switching a dust extractor for right. anything. I don't care. Like right. I'm over it. I'm going to spend another $600 because I don't want to switch one hose like twice that day to another tool. So in my workshop, I have four different angle grinders all set up with one with a wire brush, one with a flap disc, one with, and then uh, one's with a diamond blade and one with a, an abrasive wheel. It's like, I hate... I hate switching but that, out. But that's just yeah. it. It's like if you can buy, if you can make time for someone, like you're giving back time It's with right. everything. Like that's what, you know, John, we talk about, you talk about the podcast, how like hopefully there's a tip, like a nugget in every one of these episodes that buys them more time with their family or whatever the case may be. It's those little things that they, they whether it, they're realizing it in the design phase or after they're done like Lexington, and then every day they're like, man, this is so nice. I don't have to unplug your toothbrush anymore. Right. And it's just, like, it's, it's those little, those very little things that you solve. I, but yeah. So why, why step away from architecture? Uh, one is I think I can, I, I sort of saw the trajectory of zero energy design, which again, super proud of, you know, they win. They're always in like the top five for like our pretty cool magazines, like sustainability yeah. awards. Like they, they crush it. Um, but they're not dealing with affordable housing at scale. And that's like my ultimate goal right now. I'm still in the DIY kind of influencer stage, but I, you know, I'm, there'll be, I just did talks at Google, uh, right before sort of the, the COVID outbreak. Um, and that video should be going out, coming out soon. And that sort of, uh, outlines how I'm going to use the sort of media uh, audiences that I built to sort of, uh, push forward, uh, innovation in affordable housing, which is, you know, what I'm sort of, you know, hoping will be my ultimate sort of legacy. Um, and I think that big part of that will just be like educating consumer bases about like, here's how you can actually build simpler. Here's how you can Mm -hmm. leave off layers. If you're trying to commission your, your home. Okay you know, reduce labor costs, but up sort of material costs, right? Uh, Build a, you know, hire someone to build a really well insulated building shell, and then you build out and maybe even hang your own closet doors or build out that kind of shelving or, or do your own kitchen cabinets, make your own concrete countertops. If you're a couple that's in their sort of like late twenties, and that's the difference between you living in a really ill fitting, poorly built you know suburban house from the 80s versus commissioning something that's really what you want um do that right like if i if i can or an avalon uh, i mean those people are living in those avalon massive units that are just i don't know so uh that was the main reason of getting away from architecture also architecture is so much client it's client driven Mm -hmm. um which from a lifestyle standpoint means that you're either you're, you're hustling to sign new clients and then you're hustling to get all the work done on time. Right. Um, whereas with this kind of media business model, it's, it's sort of more self-driven. I can have an idea and I can choose to whether, let's say if I, I oh, so I just had an idea uh, for a floating bed. I've always wanted to make a bed that appears to be floating. Just so, a second. You just had that idea. I thought he, uh, that's what I thought <laughs> he was getting at. I was like, did he just like, have right, uh, you I ever thought go. about the need for yeah. house plants? Yes. So uh, a few weeks ago, I sort of said like, you know, I've, I've been thinking about how I would do it for a while or I've wanted to do a floating bed for a while and I wasn't going to do it with magnets or anything that crazy. Um, Boo. So I kept thinking about like, what would be the simplest way to still give that illusion of making it float. And then about two or three weeks ago, I sort of said, Ooh, I think I could just use one inch steel this way, tie it into the wall this way, hide all the connections with a live edge slab and, uh, uh, do a very minimal point where it touches the ground. Um, but at a height where you can't see where it touches the ground. And, uh, you know, two weeks later, now we're sort of posted some initial uh, samples of what that content looks like on Instagram, and then we'll have a YouTube video coming out. So that's an example where I can go from idea to a finished project that reaches hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in like three to four weeks. So that's really fun. Um, With the container house, I can have like a back burner project where I'm working on something that's going to take 
you know, a year to two years of sort of project planning, building, and then sort of uh, 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 doing all the editing to kind of show the finished product uh, through the process. Um, so for me, it's like, there, I have like short-term ideas that I'm really excited about and long-term ideas that I'm really excited about. And now I don't have to like fit those into a client schedule or try to sell them to the client. I can simply plan out the way that I want to achieve them on my own and then pitch different brands to, to give me money to do them. I love what you said in your TED talk that you're able to accomplish these tasks or these ideas or items so quickly that the next new idea isn't a burden on the one that you're trying to get through. Right. Like that was really cool where it's like, Nick, I feel like you could have that issue all the time where like, mm-hmm. you got this project that's awesome, but it's gonna take eight months to do. Right. But then this next client comes along and you're like, whoa, but that's really, really cool. Right. Hire more though- people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but I can understand, like I love that takeaway from your TED talk that it was like, that I could see at any level being something right. that's a burden. Well, when we, when we do a custom architecture project, you're not just designing one house because you're showing them options that you're actually designing. It's almost like a choose your own adventure kind of book. There's all these like dead end forks so where true. You, you know, for schematic design, we show them three different options. And then for the design development, showing another three options. And so you could almost have another whole other house design that's totally different just from the byproducts that the client didn't choose. Um, yeah, and then you start the job and you're <laughs> doing how many more options because right. they want to make changes. Right, and then so hence what the I house plan like, houseplan.com right so it's like that that was what you know for for free green the idea was is like oh we could design houses actually really fast if there's no client and we're just using our best judgment so so much of the time and service was in the decision making process of the client so this was a way to sort of just you know put creativity on the paper and harness all the value that way um and then just let the market decide what they like or don't like john to your point like that is that that's absolutely what I struggle with from a content distribution side. It's like, you know, and I think that's one of the hardest things that we do. And I'm envious of the short term projects because it's like, all I want to do is film this entire project all the way to completion and then show up in front of it when it's all done and say, and let me walk you through the process and then have eight months of film done. And it's like, we talked about this yesterday. Doug and I talked about this yesterday. He's like, we can do that, but that means we're we're pausing everything, right? And we're and then you like we're gonna film for eight months, and then from that point it will be consistent. But yo, yeah. that changed. Like I grew up in an era where I was cool waiting that time on this old house to be like, all right, we're making our way through the whole thing, and right. I was totally cool with it. But now, now Amazon not. is like, why it's not Prime? How is it not yeah. on my doorstep? I just pushed the button. And I feel like everyone has that expectation for everything we do. Which I think that's, I mean, to, to Ben, like that's, I think being able to, from the content side, now it's it's making a little bit more sense. And what I'm seeing is that the content for the short-term projects is basically helping fund the long-term projects, big picture, which the ultimate passion project goal is to solve more affordable sustainable homes contribute to the solution i don't think i don't think it's it's such a massive problem that like no one will will solve it um but for this we'll just put it on you right what's what's the (laughs) deep the i mean it it would be somewhat apparent at face value the deeper meaning for that but is is there anything other than that you feel as though giving back or helping people um, you know, what's, what's your reasoning for doing that or kind of, I, I don't like to ever say that there's an altruistic reason for doing things. Cause it just, whether someone's it's indecipherable, whether someone's I think in a lot of cases, genuine or disingenuous about sort of altruistic reasons. It's like they're, I think it's a big problem. I think that's, that's fair to say, particularly in California right now. So for like one of the next projects we're doing is we're going to try to build a stick built house about a uh, thousand square feet, uh, a little, maybe around like sort of a, yeah, maybe 1200, sort of a three bedroom, two bath, single story ranch house. We're going to try to build it for a hundred thousand dollars, not including land or anything like that. Um, so septic will already be there and stuff. And we think that as an idea, especially in a state like California, which has such a huge housing shortage and also has some of the strictest regulations, that's like a really exciting challenge and it's really hard. So that's like, 
for for me it's like i like the challenges i like it when they're sort of doable but really hard but not completely impossible and frustrating and that feels like about the right challenge level and the the added benefit is knowing that it's useful it's not like uh you know climbing mount everest just so you can put your own flag there it sure. will be something that's hard that you get some sort of glory or satisfaction or whatever you want to call it out of it for just like exercising your trade and honing your own skills. That's fun. I love the feeling of competency and doing something well is a great feeling. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really nice. And, it, and also to see yourself get better over time is a really satisfying thing. I remember when I finally realized that, oh, wait, I'm really good at cutting freehand with a circular saw because I've been doing it, you know, pretty often over the last five years and it, it never it finally just you know uh dawned on me that like oh i always thought of myself as more of an amateur because i'm not a, a construction worker i'm more of a designer but as a designer using it every day you become good at it so it's crazy to me that that's the, your takeaway yeah so out you, of all the stuff more, you've accomplished yeah it's, cut, it's cutting cut, freehand cut freehand i'm thinking all it's, the details you've made it zero energy design yeah. like nope that's it just straight free. cuts so you you feel more so that you're fulfilling a need but it's not necessarily based on like a general I'm not comfortable talking about like, selflessness yeah no because it's it's like i roll my eyes often when i hear people saying stuff like that it's like but you know i i always find it interesting when someone just goes this is the work that i do i'm really proud of it i'm pretty good at it here's how i did it here's why i do what i do you don't need the kind of like i'm doing it to save this group or doing it to help these people mm-hmm. that becomes apparent through the work itself you, you know you, you that, that it shouldn't be part of calling your shot um it's an area yeah, i'm interested I, in I, I, yeah i agree with that i think a lot of times people do stuff for the sake of being able to say that they're doing it um right. where it's like if you really just want to be doing it out of the goodness of your heart you should just be doing it and it should kind of be left unsaid and, and, and honestly, I don't even get that deep to thinking about whether or not it is the goodness of my heart or is it just a way that I feel that like I'll get like societal recognition. I, I think those those questions are, are really complex and don't always even matter. Um, what matters is that did you actually do it? Um, and so in terms of like the motivation, that's I try to keep it that simple. It's like I like challenges. I think challenges are fun. I think some challenges actually in addition to entertaining yourself also are useful for other people. So why not do those ones? Do you, uh, if, do you if, also, if all else is equal, do um, you also feel like it, it's like in, when I hear the story and I, I've seen your accomplishments, like a lot of us have the chase, like to accomplish, like, all right, maybe I, I built that crazy house that when I set out as a carpenter, that was my goal. You kind of hit that with, with Zed, like you guys yeah. like out of school, this great partnership, you did a lot in a short amount of time where most people have to work almost the entire career to get to that accomplishment where now you're able to look back and have a little bit of luxury of going, hey, I sold this. I can right. now not you know, just dabble in stuff, but you can then ha- do it on your terms. Right. Like that whole client thing where you're always on the terms of someone else. Now you're doing it on your time. So, I mean... I feel like a lot of people, at least when I listened to your story and a couple other things, I was like, yeah, I would do the same thing if I, you know, rocked a website, sold it to somebody else. Right. And then I was able to do this. I would love to be able to have that luxury. And I think to, to your success and to your drive is that you're actually doing something with that. Yeah, there's, it's weird. Like success and autonomy are not necessarily two trajectories that are always in line. Mm-hmm. Uh I know a lot of really successful people that make a ton of money that feel like they have less options than they've ever had um, because it, it's like they feel like they have to like keep doing these things because of what's happened. Um, you know, the after you have a little bit of success, uh, trying to take back that autonomy uh, normally comes with risk. So I have a pretty, as an entrepreneur, I have a pretty high risk tolerance um, and, you know, even going from uh, academia, uh, t- you know, teaching at Cornell and Northeastern University to architecture, and then to like ultimately becoming a YouTuber, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of like reputational risk that you're taking because if it doesn't work out, you're gonna be like, "Wow, what an idiot!" Like, 
that guy like you know uh stopped working at this like great firm uh gave up some equity you know still stayed on as a as a partner but not one of the you know the the main managing directors just so he could make like stupid youtube videos that nobody watched like i'm really glad people ended up watching those videos because otherwise it would have felt frankly would have felt really dumb and would have felt like a huge failure um so it's not that the 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 justification or self-worth comes from you know how many clicks you get online but if you give up something to sort of chase something else that's going to give you different options it's scary when you're contemplating whether or not it'll actually work yeah i mean i think that that's that's kind of a, a very common theme throughout life in general and i think with careers and business and any sort of decision you know john even starting your company over where it's like you left a career making x amount of money to start your own thing i think if you focus on the what ifs uh you probably stunt your potential and stunt your growth because it's like well this could happen or that could happen and then you start second guessing that and maybe don't actually even take that first step yeah sometimes you just have to be ignorant yeah, but actually, if you guys don't mind, I, have a few, I had a, a couple sort of questions because I, I don't always get to talk to builders at your guys' level. Um, so it's what all do you smoke guys... and mirrors. It's none of it's no, true. No, no, no. So <laughs> I'm really interested in like trends that you guys see that are coming or sort of things that you guys are into that you think haven't quite caught on yet that, that, that should. Um, so well, to speak to like building science, right? right. I, we had... Um... Oh Christine, gosh. no, she was on it. But who was? Um, I want to help you here because I've know. always Mott, been that that guy. That, oh, huh? Mott, no, Mott. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me for a second. I, I, it's um, do it with your hands. Do it with yes, your hands. on the podcast. Gary Katz. Gary Katz. Mm. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't put Gary Katz at building science. Together. No, but, oh, we, yeah, okay. but he All talked right, about building in the eighties mm-hmm. and how they were building passive homes in the like in the 80s right Right. and he made this comment and i immediately said to my i I think i said on the podcast i'm like that was a thing back then he's like oh yeah Yeah. like you know it was huge and i was like we're talking 40 years ago and we're still like dabbling with it right so look what's happening outside right now what like gray black lives like matter it's rain. like that's been a thing that's happened forever yeah <laughs> like there's not a lot there's change but then I see, there's I, I i see what you're saying but siri thinks i'm talking to her uh not you um i i, I john great point the Sorry. the no no it's it's a good point the it's just surprising to me that you know 40 years go by and it's just been this trickling this trickling idea However, I think it was with Christine Williamson that we were talking to about how now products are like now there it was like Tyvek and tar paper and Tipar, you know, five years ago. And now it's like zip, blue skin, Sega, right. fluid applied. And it's like now stuff is happening so quickly that it's, you know, there there was never the, it was it was like there's, there was never a ramp up period. So right. to your question, I think that. Um, the the building science is becoming much more relevant in everyone's you know practice. I think it's going to be. It, it, I think it's there's going to be a tremendous amount of failure with it, right? Because the the education isn't happening as fast as the product development. And and yeah. all yeah. So I, I, that's a really interesting point. And so the way I sort of sum that up is in battery powered circular saws. Like I remember like mm-hmm. six years ago, if you had like a entry level battery powered circular saw, it was Sucked. struggle city to get through <laughs> a full sheet of plywood. Um, now I just use one with a Diablo blade, a brushless motor, a circular saw under a hundred dollars, and I could cut through quarter inch thick plate steel. Right. Yeah, with like right. not an abrasive. It was like, whoa, 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 where did this all happen? So right it wasn't one thing getting better. And I think whenever people look for trends, they look for like one thing that's gonna change everything, this disruptor. When really you're looking at like, how are five different things that are all improving 3% a year gonna synergistically kind of combine to create a massive improvement t- together, you know, 
uh, three or four years from now. And that's what happens now. You know, going in five, five or six years isn't that much time. But to go from struggling through a three quarter sheet of plywood to just cruising through plate steel is in that's that's dramatic. If you would right. have explained that to me back then, I would say, oh, we have some sort of battery powered plasma laser cutter that would do that. Nope. It's just that the, the ceramic tips on the blade got better. The brushless motor got better and the battery got better. And all those things sort of combined to create a pretty dramatic difference. Um, and I think the same thing is in, is in is happening in building science. Insulation gets better, sheathing gets better, starting to develop new studs with, you know, uh, without the sort of thermal bridging. All those things coming together are going to be the dramatic thing. So mm -hmm. people are always looking for the flying cars, but it's probably like a bunch of little subtle differences adding up to make the flying car not even necessary. Nick, I thought for sure you'd say panelized construction. Yeah. I thought for sure. I think that, I mean, to, to, to Ben's whole plan, I think that's a huge cost savings. Yeah. And material savings, frankly. I mean, I, I, I was going to, talk about that a little bit is in your designs you know are, is the size of walls and the layout of homes considered to the point where we worked with an architect and worked in his own home and i remember we were we were talking about cost and building building new and he had i believe done studies he was like yeah the best thing to do is build your house in seven foot increments because seven foot increments get, net you the most bang for your buck with material mm. and i was like wh why and he's like because you can buy 14 foot studs and they're less per foot and blah 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 and he's just going and, he, and i'm like and i thought to myself i'm like all right well is that like is that a consideration are you going to that level and i'm asking you personally are you going to that level you know when you're trying to you're going to try to start uh you're going to try to build this house for a hundred thousand dollars so no, because I think that level of efficiency requires that level of project management. Uh, right. So for me, it's much more about how do I make the cheapest things look amazing, mm -hmm. um, right? So how do I, you know, concrete floors on slab on grade foundation? Uh, how do I? Uh, Nick can make that expensive. Right. <laughs> Uh, how I do have. I make the how do I make the mill work right? I, I'm, uh, I'm liking my the persona I'm gaining on this podcast. <laughs> uh, so it's you know one of the big things that we're looking at is we want a lot to let in a lot of light on the north side. So it's a you know we're building in Joshua Tree. Uh, we have a lot of like really nice uh, uh, you know the house is going to be sort of oriented north to south, which is pretty ideal. Windows and doors, huge part of things. So we're going to use a lot of polycarbonate, you know, the greenhouse stuff, the triple walled polycarbonate to let in light. Mm -hmm. So we'll figure out a detail there to replace, you know, $10,000 worth of glass with $800 worth of polycarbonate. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So in order to get to the point where we feel comfortable doing that, we start integrating polycarbonate into our workflow a couple of years ago by building furniture projects. Now we're yeah. going to be doing a solar powered sauna out of it. So we slowly, we see a material that has potential like polycarbonate. It, it holds up pretty nice. You just have to figure out a good detail to kind of seal off the channel so bugs and dust don't get into it. Have you, have you do you watch Grand Design? Yeah, I love it. D they, they did a polycarbonate house. Yeah. I watched that episode literally last night. Yeah. And it's, I, I didn't realize how it was made and they went to the factory. It's, it's very cool and it's insulating. I haven't seen that one, but I'll definitely check that out. So, uh, but the, the minute I see a potential of something, I'll be like, okay, I don't want to drop everything and then jump to now I'm going to make all my buildings out of polycarbonate. Right. But what I want to say is like, I need to know if this is a real solution or if my hunch is wrong. And, and I have so many hunches that are wrong. So I'll test it incrementally. So I'll build a furniture project out of it, build like a small outbuilding out of it. If it still looks good, maybe I'll build like lighting for a garage or not a critical space out of it. And then if all those experiments look good and pick up some, some tips, then I might, you know, feel safe applying it into a house. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I do that, you know, if it sort of works in that house, then I'll sort of say, okay, we can now, now let in a lot of light uh, for way cheaper than glass. Um, you know, it has a, a better thermal properties than, than, than glass does. And it can look pretty cool if, it, if it's done right. So those are the kind of ways that we'll try to sort of really get the, the, the cost down is, identify something, but then set up the experiments in a way where we make money on the experiments. Ben, do you, did you remember back in the day when you were at Zed 
I, I feel like 100K home was big back then. Remember the kid in Philly? Yeah. That was oh, doing, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Post Green Homes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I went, I went uh, out there with... Ludman. Yeah, I went out with Brian, and, and the kid was just buying up blocks they, and making it happen. I, I love those, like, what they did. I just yeah. think that's such a cool thing that they just, like, they... They they worked in the place they knew and loved, and they made well, they the city lived. better. Yeah, they lived. They, they lived they, right there. Like I, I I think that's so awesome to to do that kind of stuff. And if there's something that like or you know all of our urban environments need, it's that kind of. I think Place Taylor does a lot of you yeah. know kind of similar stuff. Um, but well, he that did, kind he of did like, like he, that branding that he did as yeah. well at that time was kind of earth shredding because then he did like the passive house one. Like, right. and they were all within like you could throw a stone and where from where he lived to all the, the ones he was doing. The branding was brilliant, but it was contained in such a regionally specific set mm. of designs that it couldn't really expand past that. Um, so uh, we'll be trying to do take some of that, you know, that, you know that, that idea. I think is so tangible to a lot of people. Um, obviously, they were doing it back then when I think it was a little bit easier. I think it's going to be a lot tougher now. A yeah. uh, l- little bit of a economic expansion since then, uh, and 100 k doesn't go as far as it used to, but I still think it's a doable target. For sure. I'm excited to see that come together. When are you guys starting that project? Uh, we just got the, we just uh, hired a structural engineer, so we're just doing structural stuff right now. Um, so about a year, you think? All said and done? I don't know. It, it depends. It's like, we can build pretty fast. Like, I think permits will probably be like another three months from now um and i don't know i think we could build it in like four or five months it's, well, it's you, really simple like again well it's gotta you know, be yeah, yeah uh you know four corners all that kind of stuff sure so do you market that to your sponsors first uh for the container house yes for this one no i'll probably like cherry pick um i'll probably go for a you know one sort of structural component uh, right now we're talking to Katera, uh, which doesn't really do a lot of residential stuff. Uh, they do more like multifamily and institutional buildings, but they have some interesting sort of glue land things they want to promote. Um, we might reach out to sort of, you know, Huber and Zip and all that if we if we do decide to go that route. Um, but we really only need like three or four because the other thing too, worst case scenario, and we don't find the right fit that actually works with the design, we can always just, you know, get sponsorship from the blue aprons or the square spaces of the, you know, of the world. And all those direct to consumer brands are a pretty good staple just because of audience size. The reason why I asked that is because like Nick has this awesome idea and image of, of building this crazy modern house in, in new England. That's kind of inspired from that Australian company. Am I correct, mm-hmm. Nick? Yeah. And I was oh, just yeah. sick. We're, we're talking about it. Like I do specs, but yet they always get sold. So you go back to that client driven model again or it's you know profit because the investors want their money back so nick maybe it's scaled down so it's not a six thousand square foot house yeah. with those details but maybe you have a, a a great pull in the digital market which is yeah. you could always do it where you put this together with those players and create it that way and there's no investors there's no client based and you're at your own right. you know mercy but to get to build what you want, it kind of embeds kind of world, which I think I love it. Gives it's, you the best product at the end. Yeah, uh, I love the idea, and it's you know it, it's something we've kind of toyed around with as far as doing it that way. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned it though, because yesterday I had a conversation with a realtor that specializes in modern. Dude, yesterday was a big day for you. It was huge. Day. I mean, got the, so much done. The chalkboard <laughs> has exactly what Ben said. Whiteboard. <laughs> Whiteboard. Yeah. Um, it it does. I'm gonna take a picture. It's mine. He watched the um, polycarbonate TV yeah, show. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> um, man, I did get a lot done yesterday. You should play the numbers tonight. I know. Yeah. Uh, is the corner store open? Um, I don't even remember what my point was. Oh, I talked to a realtor, and they were. I was explaining just that about the the, the modern house and how it's like it's Melbourne, Australia, but it's like very West Coast California, hillside home, blah blah blah. And they were like, "Yeah, it's just not going to work here." Yeah, because they don't I'm make like, any money. Yeah, I'm like, I just, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk yep. to people that are going to tell me that it, it, it might not work. But, but you look definitely at look at Ben. It. Look at Ben. Right. If no, he listened right. to what everyone was thinking, right? No, I he would still high be a risk tolerance here. Right. High risk tolerance. Nick is uh, right behind Nick, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty Nick, high risk. Nick tolerance. doesn't have an issue with <laughs> uh, risk. Can we take a break for just a second? I just got to use yeah. the bathroom. Yeah. No 
I mean, one, I think more information is always good. So absolutely more information to consumers, I think will always be a good thing. I think the question is just whether or not, uh, you know, does that actually lead to more efficient homes? Uh, I think one of the, the, the big challenges that I sort of see holistically is in a lot of places like California or like in Josh Tree right now, people are incentivized to buy these really terribly built little cabins, you know, really flimsy two by four, not even properly framed, uh, you know, really shoddy insulation, no moisture barrier or anything like that. Just, you know, exterior grade plywood, two by fours, fiberglass insulation and drywall. So people are spending their time to sort of buy these cheap, poorly designed and built stuff and just kind of like fix it up because, you know, it's already no sprinklers or anything like that. Just, just get it kind of livable and then flip that rather than build from scratch because from building from scratch, you have to meet all, you know, title 24, uh, sprinklers and all this kind of stuff. So I think the, it's a the bigger problem right now in a lot of places is that the way codes are and or not necessarily where they are, but the way they're enforced, I think is probably the better way to say it. It incentivizes people to just keep patching up garbage rather than build things that are actually more energy efficient. Uh, and what that r- results in is that, uh, you know, I used to live in, in uh, Charlestown and this like just terrible three unit building. And it's the owner of that building is going to just keep renting it out, keep making money, just do the bare minimum to get by. So I think what, for me, what would be more important, and I pitched this to the the last mayor when I was in their sort of one in three council on housing, uh, was like, okay, incentivize the the homeowner to build to a higher energy standard. Give them a, and, and do it in a way that will also increase density. So I actually wrote this like proposal that was saying like, if you live within half a mile of a T station, you know, public transportation, places that need density to fund ridership and all these things that would be good for that, that struggling uh, ecosystem. Uh, why don't you grant uh, exceptions where people can increase their three, their R3 to R4, they, but you know, at a minimal increase to FAR, but they have to build to a really aggressive energy standard. Um, and you know, the parking shouldn't be too much of an issue because you are close to public transportation. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll be getting more density with the same amount of like carbon emissions and utility usage. You'll incentivize people to possibly tear down some of these buildings that have, you know, field stone foundations and really drafty and uh, not well made and actually build something new because they can get better rent revenue out of the next um so i think it's like the information is one thing but it's only as good in terms of how it incentivizes action uh so i'm always for transparency but what i think even taking it as just a step beyond that uh would be how do we incentivize actions to just you know to fix the things rather than just patch it up and keep these inefficient things going i mean i think cambridge did adopt just that yeah yeah. Cambridge, you know, we're able to build more square footage as right. long as we're more efficient. Yeah, uh, think, which was which was great. Yeah, I think that's I, such a such a you know those kind of things really get me excited when when you, you know, I, I see those put into place. I think it's got to be both sides of it though. I think yeah. put, putting hers out there. I think it's. I don't know if it'll change how people build right away, but I think having the market educated on what it is. Because, I mean, having someone buy a house and not pull a permit and renovate it and then flip it, we're never going to be able to track that. Right. Uh, it's it's never going to happen. But if it's if it's new stuff going up where if, like, let's say Wellesley in particular, where, where we do a couple specs, it's like I put all my heart and soul into having an unbelievable envelope, low her scores where, the, you know, the code's what, 70, and I'm getting 35s and 40s, but yet I'm not getting any more value out of the home. Because A, no one knows it, and B, no one knows how poor the other house that's the same price point is. For And right. that, that relates to comfort and all that stuff. So it's, I guess, I keep thinking that if it's out there and people look at it, they go, huh, like it's one more thing to look at where you're like, I, I can see that. I can understand it. And then more people talk about it and say, you see what this hurt score is? That house right. is brand new. But I mean, I think it hurts the market in general. That's why realtors won't go for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think it's, I, I think that would be a, you know, a, a large net positive. 
agree of, of requiring that i mean it's it's not crazy i mean with the the car industry does a pretty you know or does a, uh, a better job of that you know there's there's all these things they have to disclose um you know about miles per gallon and they have to really articulate it has to be tested in the same way um but also that regulation stalls certain types of innovation as well so it's you know the from what i understand and i'm not an expert on car automation or, or manufacturing but from what i've heard anecdotally is that one of the reasons why your you know your phone is such a better gps device than the stuff built into your car is because it has to go through so many cycles of regulation and it's always like three years behind where you know other consumer electronic devices are so the, you know, I think it's a fine line uh, always between, you know, putting in the, the the regulation that kind of incentivizes, you know, good productive behavior and just better, healthier housing stock kind of, I think, serves everyone well, but not getting so much that it actually inhibits the, the speed and agility of other types of innovation that weren't necessarily predicted. I just feel like that a lot of what we do right now has been focused on efficiencies and I just want to get past that hurdle so that can be more about health. Yeah. Like indoor air yeah. quality. So many so many people are focused on the things right in front of them that have changed with stretch energy and all that. But it's what about health and all this, the products you're bringing in that is just kind of put to the back, back burner because, hey, I had to spend this and this and so I'm going to buy whatever it is I want to buy. I, I don't know. I just I like no, to see that evolution happen faster. Absolutely. Although, I mean... It feels like it goes slow, but when I look back at it, man, when when I got started out of out of school, like green design was like considered like a fad and, a, and a, like a tiny little niche thing, and there was no classes at it in in architecture. Right? There, you know, there's like maybe like a li- half of the, your environmental systems design was about sustainability, and now it's like a major part of every architecture curriculum. Um, you know. Green build went from being this like little fringe hippie convention to, to being like a, you know, I think Obama spoke at the last one. Um, so, you know, the the progress is always slower than it feels like it should be. But man, when, when as you get older, uh, time you just look wow, time flew by, and you know, actually, a lot did happen. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's but, what, but, that's but, but you look at of... like the, the battery saws that we talked about, like yeah. that was like that and like youtube like that there's a couple things that that's what kind of scares me with the product market right now it's it's asbestos and lead paint and think of all the things you know 20 30 years from now there were they're going to be like oh we use this in all of our buildings we will have you can't demo i'm i feel like we're going to have a million times more just because like there's so many new products whether it's liquid waterproofing all right, so you're now spreading liquid rubber on stuff inside of your houses. All the paint products oh, that, we like, use, like Red Guard kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, like there's yeah, just so many that, things that, that smells straight up like cancer. Yeah, there's so <laughs> many things that we use, like spray foam. How are you gonna demo spray? That definitely causes cancer of some sort. Where flex like, seal. I, uh, yeah, everything flex that we put seal. in. Weedy. If you, can make, if you can make a boat out of a screen door, it can't be good for you. Yeah, like weedy. All of those. Yeah. Um, sealants that we're using now i feel like it's going to be a nightmare all right you see you sound like one of my youtube commenters that keeps telling me i should be building with hempcrete every day yeah you could <laughs> not tell them, them you gotta tell them it, prove it prove it's it it's funny so i have an older brother who lives in he has like a ranch in argentina and he built his entire house from by hand like it's all like adobe and field stone with like yeah eucalyptus beams hand hewn it's gorgeous but it is like not reproducible at all it's all you know hobbit hole kind of craftsmanship it looks phenomenal it looks like straight out of uh some sort of like uh you know just idealistic old world setting um and he's like like pretty far on the hippie spectrum uh but uh yeah so it's like you know uh we, we have these very lively debates about what sustainability and green design is and you know he's a little bit strident and thinks that it has to be everything coming from the earth and that I tend to be somewhere in the, in the middle, like, well, let's, let's be careful with like the, the liquid plastics and these kind of things. Uh, but not so far as that, you know, I'm, uh, making earthen floors out of horse manure and boiled yeah, linseed like oil. It's like and a fourth a, grade a science tamper. project. Right. Yeah. 
It's like you're going to make a brick out of stuff that you can find outside and see which one holds up the best. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't quite go, yeah, full earthy. I don't think yet. I mean, I guess you can here. It would be tough. Like, I feel like if somebody did that in my town, Do I'd, any probably, you guys get I'd those, probably judge them. The, those videos, I, I feel like on Facebook, I get a video all the time of like this kid in the middle of the woods and then he just, he's digging up mud, he mixes it with water and then he builds bricks and he builds a whole entire house. Yeah. This, I've, I've seen, seen the seen Southeast that. Asian ones are incredible. Like and Thailand then he, and or, then, or And then he Laos digs out a pool and then he's like yeah. just hanging out in his pool. Like, I'm like, where, this kid... Is that the How guy that's long? smiling? Is that the guy smiling at you the whole time? No, no that's, that's the cook. Yeah, <laughs> that's the cook. That's he like makes the, giant, yeah. giant pizzas with big fish yeah. on it. Yeah, no. Yeah, I've um, seen but the it's guy like, like he walks into the woods with a hatchet and basically yeah. makes an yeah. entire so house. Primitive makes, technologies, like, I think, is like the gold standard for that stuff. It's a YouTube channel. I it's, I can highly highly recommend it. It's he so cool. He's an Australian engineer, I think. And he just goes out into the woods with nothing but his two, or I mean, it's more of, I think they call it the bush uh, out there. Uh, nothing but his two hands. And he basically just sort of recreates human civilization up to like the early Iron Ages. Yeah, it's it's like, it's absolutely wild. Yeah. It, except for the fact that he's filming it and putting it on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. A, lot, a lot of time lapse. <laughs> and he's wearing like, like synthetic athletic shorts. <laughs> either that or cargo pants. You had to kind of go one way yeah. or the other. Yeah that minor detail yeah. Ben this was awesome man really appreciate you uh, making the time and being flexible with us my pleasure looking forward to, to collaborating someday we'll figure out some way to work together but uh, I think there's Absolutely. a ton of things we could do dude I, I just I, I, I think I speak for all of us I really appreciate your your motive and your drive and what you're you're striving for I mean that you know I think that's something we all struggle with a balance of being you know in the top tier market and then leaving mm -hmm. The, the bottom tier out when they're just as deserving and any part you know any way we can contribute to that help you know Nick, that he's cause. doing it for the challenge oh yeah, yeah that's right my bad that's right but, <laughs> well, the, the, but sometimes yeah. even more appreciation <laughs> yeah ne ne next time yeah. I'm, in, I'm in boston i'll hit you guys up and I'd, I'd love to see what you're working on and again like you know, yeah, you're welcome to. You got you to give me a month notice before you show up and start walking <laughs> one of my sites. No, <laughs> I got to no, clean some stuff up. Just first. come. When, I'll let you know when we're ready to waterproof. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll help with the red guard. All right, guys. It was a ben, pleasure. Take Yo, care, man. Guess what? You didn't ruin the podcast, and I guess you can go enjoy yourself now. It's five thirty. There, you're good <laughs> yeah, to go. It's, it's definitely cocktail hour now. We got we're one in the books. Nice. With some gin right now. All right, guys. Thanks, man. Take care, man. See ya. All right, guys. Well, we do have a couple of reviews. Unfortunately, we have a one one star. Oh, I love. Yes. Is it about um, me? It's probably about me. No, it's not. And I mean, obviously, not trying to offend anyone. Uh, pretty good content regarding business and talent. Turned off enough. Turned off enough by the coarse language used and using God's name in vain, in particular. So I exited the podcast. Whatever happened to noble nobility of civil discourse? So uh, certainly not our intent to offend anyone. So apologize on behalf of that. What uh, coarse language? I think it was directed to using God's name in vain. Oh. Who was so, that? Me? Yeah, probably. Uh, I mean, I I, I definitely <laughs> said it on this one. So it's not, <laughs> did again, you say no. probably or probably me? <laughs> probably me. Oh. oh. Well, we got two good ones or a handful of good ones. Uh, not your target audience, but I still listen. Hey guys, just want to drop you a quick review. I feel I'm not your target audience as I'm a mechanical engineer in the aerospace industry, so I don't do not make a living in the trades. I've always been interested in carpentry in general, so I really enjoy hearing y'all's discussions. I'm also in the process of planning to have a home built with my wife, so I'm trying to grab nuggets here and there to apply them to our future home planning and build. Thanks for what you do. At Self Coast Dad. And what is it? South Coast Dad. South Coast Dad. He he added. He wrote IG handle. South oh Coast really? Dad. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Let's look up. Hey guys, I've been a subscriber to your podcast for a while now, but just recently started listening. Love it. Just got done with the Justin Fink episode. I recently started my own small carpentry company business in Eastern North Carolina. Keep it up, guys. All right. Yeah. yeah. Was Not it South Kep Coast Deli. Kev, Kev, uh, no. Kevin O'Connor reached out to me after that that podcast. <laughs> Which we one? Talked to the uh, one with Justin. When Justin brought up my debate with Kevin. Oh, boy. 
Oh, yeah. Kevin, Kevin comes like, yeah, no, episode. he was just like, he's like, dude, you had a great, you held your own. Like he was like talking oh, me good. up like a dad. It was great. Well, speaking of dad, South Coast dad, you get the free hat. Email us. We'll ship you one out. Yep. What's I his name? At South Coast dad. No, what's his actual name? Doesn't say. Oh, he's in the UK. Well, at least that's who South Coast dad is coming up. Well, there's two actually. Is it? Well, guys, next episode, <laughs> we got you guys are going to hear our webinar. That oh we yeah. Rec- that we recorded uh, just a few days ago with Royal Building Products. Uh, we talk about our strategy with COVID and how we're coping with it, and how Royal Building Products, as a building materials manufacturer, uh, is adapting to the times. So if you guys didn't get to join in live, uh, stay tuned for next episode and you'll hear it there. Until then, we'll see you next week. Sorry that Nick cut you off, South Coast Dad. (laughs) He'll he'll be okay. He's getting (laughs) ahead. See ya.